Words are about to be spoken here on the Extreme Life of Mad Hardy, episode number 51, presented to you exclusively by the Ad-Free Shows Network and Podcast Heat. I, of course, am John Alba, joined as I am every single week by the broken one, the woken one, the spoken one himself, Mr. Matt Hardy. Matt, you're in San Antone. How you doing, man? Doing good in San Ann. Much chiller than I expected to be so yeah. far. How cold do you look, Matt? Texas. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, 40 degrees or so here. Okay. 40, 45 degrees in, in there. Just a little bit above... Uh, a few uh, degrees above uh, freezing, but it is chilly, much chillier than I expected. I did those three years in Bangor, Maine, and that just oh, yeah, boy, howdy, did that toughen me up for the cold. I'll oh, tell you, you that you learn how to live with it doing three years in Bangor, Maine. I, I'm, oh, I'm sure of that, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, you guys used to go up there a lot, the old Bangor Auditorium there back in the days, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bangor was always a good spot. I always loved going to Maine just because I felt like you almost half-assed got out of the, the Northeast for a second. And it's kind of like reverted back to the niceness of the South in some ways. Maine was a lot more civil. It wasn't very, it didn't have that typical Northeastern personality where it's like, you know, beep, 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 you know, just people were a little more easygoing, a little more laid back and nice. There were definitely elements of Maine that were very much like the South for best and for better and for worse yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day there. Uh, plus, you, you you did get the good seafood. So there's yes. no doubt about that, which is always a good thing. And we'll talk about seafood a little more uh, down the line. But it's uh, Christmas week here, my friend. Right. And uh, any any big plans that you got coming up for Christmas here? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're going to do a big Christmas at home. We, we might have a little bit of a family gathering, so to say, but, uh, we, we definitely have to get all the kids in bed early and we have to go to bed early too, because, uh, mm -hmm. that night, once we get past midnight, Santa's got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of toys to put out for four different kids. So it's okay. going to be, it's going to be a busy night. One of my favorite pieces of hearty content was last year's video you did with the kids ahead of Christmas. So Hopefully we get another one this year because I would love to see. Uh, I, I know Bartholomew asked Santa for a deletion last year. So I'm, I'm curious if he's wishing for the same. Uh, all the kids on on the good list this year, or maybe one of them sneak on the naughty list. They've done really. You know, Wolfie has had a. Uh, uh, he's transcended this year. He's be <laughs> become so kind and so like empathetic and so nice and like affectionate, which is so weird because he's still. A little bit of a loose cannon in many ways. He has this huge charisma about him. He loves to speak with people. He is the master of conversing with strangers when we're out in the streets. But he's been he's been really good. He definitely made the good list. Max has been very sweet. He always has been. He's good. Barty is a little bit of a wild card when it comes to Bartholomew, for sure. So he's he's uh, kind of the most unpredictable when it comes mm -hmm. to the kids. And then Gothic Baby's just starting to find their way. I know just a, a couple of days ago, I put her on the change table and I was like changing her diaper and just put her on her diaper and I got on her face like, oh my God, you're so cute. And she slapped the shit out of me like hard as hell too. I was like, whoa, you can get away doing that to Dada. But I promise you, if you do it to Mama, it's going to be a very a, a quite a different reaction from her. You looked at her and said, we won't be doing that again. <laughs> it's okay with me. I, I, I'm a worker, brother. I can, I can do that. I can, I can, I can, I can take her impact. Uh, but yeah, if that happened to Mama, it'd be we won't be doing that one again. <laughs> it always tickles me whenever we just hear uh, these these stories that we tell on this podcast. You know, getting over with people. Uh, <laughs> we we even got. Uh, a tweet from uh, at Josh Breezy, who said he did this yeah. gigantic, he showed video of him doing a gigantic. Uh, yeah, that was great. Yeah, I saw that. That was great. What and up, he, Josh Breezy? And, and he said the whole time he was just thinking about, we won't be doing that again after. <laughs> <laughs> after Fantastic, man. So, so, so good. So good. We love stuff like that. Man, listen, uh, it, it's great. We love seeing stuff like that on social media. And, you know, you're talking about the kids being good, man especially the holiday season, it is just not a hard thing to be a good person. It is so not a hard thing to be kind and uh, to not say stupid things to people. So uh, heed, heed that as a lesson, my friends, as we head into this crazy time, the holiday season. 
be be a kind person, especially to people you don't know. It goes a long way, doesn't it? It, it absolutely does, and and it, it doesn't make any difference in your day. It doesn't make it any worse. It just literally makes it better. Like just be kind to people. Just just be kind. Be a kind human being. It's easy. If, if you're not, you're just an fi, and there are plenty of fi's out there. <laughs> they're everywhere. These in-house fi's, they're everywhere. The big famous Booker T quote, man. <laughs> <laughs> a big situation broke out with some of the divas at one point booker t all of a sudden broke out in the locker room and i love booker t uh, i say this all the time i love seeing booker t i love talking to booker t legitimately one of the funniest guys especially his delivery and just his facial expressions he said these in-house reps they're everywhere and oh my god that was a line that kept going on for, forever you know, whatever it was, they're everywhere. Gosh, Booker T is the best, man. I miss, I miss being around Booker T. I miss being entertained by Booker T. Well, next time you're in Houston, give him a call. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see if you can get hooked up with him there. Um, so, Matt, I'm so excited for this week's episode because this is the Omega panel. This was recorded yeah. Thanksgiving weekend at WrestleCade. Right. And it, it is a very special look into the path of the Hardy Boys featuring some great, great characters. Uh, what can people expect over the next hour and change here? Uh, I mean, I, I think you're going to hear some some really good, sincere, heartfelt stories of like a bunch of young guys that had the same goals, that had the same aspirations to make it and and work on the highest platforms in pro wrestling, you know, and that, and that was kind of like the bond that linked us all. It really was a brotherhood. I mean, a guy that you guys will know, Caprice Coleman, who I knew as Ice or Alistair Coleman back in the day. I mean, he, he is a guy that trained, you know, underneath the tutelage of myself and Joy Abs more than anybody else. And, uh, you know, that's exactly where he started. He, he made it, you know, people know him from Ring of Honor. He still does commentary with ROH associated with AEW right now. And he will be doing commentary on ROH whenever they start on the Honor Club. Um, he's on there. You're going to see uh, it, someone who isn't an urban legend. You know, you might hear about Bigfoot. Is he real or is he not? First name Sham, last name Payne. He is real and he will be there. And uh, he's always an entertaining dude, a, a really, really great dude at his core. Uh, a, a guy who entertains the shit out of me too. He entertained The Rock so much. The Rock just took him to work and had him travel the world with him and be his personal assistant, which was amazing. He did that for like a year and a half. Uh, and then we're going to see the guy who's the money investor, Thomas Simpson. You guys know him. All you guys who follow the extreme life of Matt Hardy, he's a, a very famous character on this program. And then you'll also meet a referee, Jamie Tucker, who later went on to referee at WCW, who we met from Italian Stallions, uh, PWF, Pro Wrestling Federation. And then you'll meet Ted Hopgood, who was the voice of Omega and also the uh, original seamster of Omega. And he's the one who actually helped kind of teach me how to sew. And then uh, I took the, the 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 tricks of the trade that he taught me. And then I started running with it. And I started making gear for people, too. And, and he's the true historian and MVP of this panel, okay. as he you'll really, find yeah. out, too. He, uh, really. he, we won't be able to show you this part because of copyright, but he actually uh, introduced everyone under their old gimmick name, yeah. which which was a very cool way to start the panel. And you came out and you did your your surge entrance for the first time in a very long time, I would imagine. Yeah. And it was the perfect way to start this off. So, Matt, I say we waste no more time. Ladies and gentlemen, we give to you the long away. Oh, you got something? Go ahead. Even since we're going to have to cut it or whatever, I'm going to give them just a little bit of surge. Oh, please. What are you going to do when 10,000 watts flow? Can you survive? I don't think so. Countdown to your Armageddon. Ladies and gentlemen, the have. Omega panel. How cool was that? Come on now, right? <laughs> How'd it feel to be introduced as Surge again? Uh, that was wild. Uh, the, the music popped me big. Like, I've got it. Do you have that, Ted? Our wonderful soundman had it. Well, uh, I need to dig that up because I don't have a copy of that. Sometimes I've looked for it and I haven't been able to find it. So uh, it, that, it feels great. And it takes me back to a, an amazing childhood and an amazing time with uh, all of these gentlemen. Just like our formative days of Omega. And uh, 
it's so cool. And Ted's introductions are so great. He was he's so creative. Uh, he's so amazing, so talented in so many ways. Uh, he never got the credit he fully deserved for everything he did. Well, so we appreciate having Ted on this. Marty Garner, Caprice Coleman, Jamie Tucker, Ted Hobgood, Thomas Simpson. You hear that? The sugar daddy of Omega. But of course. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be a really special panel, guys, because uh, 25 years of an organization that, uh, quite frankly, had the internet been as prevalent as it was today, I, I think we'd still be talking about Omega as an existing entity and one of the biggest independent wrestling promotions uh, in the country. <clears throat> it's, a, it's amazing. Like, I feel like Omega's biggest claim to fame was during the tape trading days. Does anybody remember tape trading? Uh, th that was a huge deal, and like our videos ended up being out there so much, almost like the the modern wrestling style that goes on today at AAW, All Elite Wrestling, and WWE is even geared more that way too, where it's a much more athletic contest between two great athletes who do these amazing acrobatics and these amazing creative moves and whatnot. That's kind of what we wanted to do, and we never had our shows like have the opening match stay in the ring, keep it very simple, keep it elementary, and then build the card as it goes on. I remember telling everybody right from the jump like. If you guys can steal the show, steal the show. We want every match to kill it. And that was our mindset. That was our mentality. And it really became something special. I, I heard Tony Khan admitted to me at one point. He actually collected Omega uh, tapes whenever the tape trading days were going on, which is it's pretty impressive, you know, when it all comes down to it. But that, that was like our claim to fame, and that, that was so cool, especially in the south where we couldn't get a ton of press like they did up north. Uh, Omega was uh, how we got our guys' names out there. First name, Sham. Last name, Payne. Who saw, who saw first name Sham, last name Payne get his uh, head crushed in last night? <laughs> uh, last night, backstage, we were talking about the match, and, and Marty said, okay, so CP3 is going to do a run-in, and then I'm coming in. EC3, yeah. of course. It EC3, yeah. <laughs> I'm a man? big Chris Paul fan, so I said <laughs> CP3, but anyway. Uh, How'd it uh, feel? It felt good, man. It, it, it was great, man. It was, it was good to be in the, in the ring with a couple of legends, you know what I mean? And uh, it was just surreal. When I, I, when I slid in and turned Jeff Jarrett around, I said, I'm really in here doing this with, with Jarrett and Matt at the same time. This was, it was a great night, man. It was fun. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And Matt Hardy won, so ultimately yeah, that's what matters absolutely. the most, right? So, <laughs> uh, man. Revenge after seven years. <laughs> <laughs> so as we do every single week on our podcast, The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, we pay homage to many of Matt's lives of the past by asking for a Matt fact. And I hear that Matt has two Matt facts for this special Omega reunion panel. So, Matt, by all You're means. correct. Matt fact... Matt cherishes his Omega days. Matt fact, Matt is very grateful that WrestleCade exists. Me too. And a special thank you to Tracy and his team as well for making this possible. Yes, uh, everyone, Tracy, Brian, Tim, everyone who's done WrestleCade. I've been here since <clears throat> the very beginning. This is an amazing project that they have really built into something very special and it's almost like a, a, a mainstay like everybody talks about wrestlecade weekend on thanksgiving up and down the east coast people come in from all around the united states is amazing congratulations on all the success tracy you've, you've yes. been amazing so as many of you are aware this is a story that starts in the backwoods of north carolina on a trampoline cameron north carolina now, many of you have seen that story documented many times, but I would love for some perspective from our panel. When is the first time any of you guys either first heard or first saw the Hardy Boys, Matt and Jeff Hardy? I'll let anyone begin with uh, that. Well, since I have the mic now, I'll go ahead and, and put my little two cents in. Um, I worked out at Vast Fitness Center, and uh, I was what? Uh, Matt was 18, I was 24, I think, maybe 23. And uh, saw this kid working out. He's working out hard. He I, had was, a, I was 16. I just got my license. Okay, six. I'm sorry. He was 16. I was probably what 21 then, uh, yeah. or 22 maybe. And uh, this dude, man, he was jacked. He had a big V in his back, and he was just jacked. He always wore these little spaghetti string tank tops in the wintertime. <laughs> uh, wouldn't wear a coat to a football game. He was just wearing his tank top and all jacked up, you know. And uh, 
Anyway, he said, hey, man, why don't you come by the house sometime? We got a wrestling ring set up out there. And I said, uh, what? He said, yeah, we got a ring. I said, okay. Went over there, and it's a round trampoline with three garden hoses around it tied to trees. <laughs> and uh, they had an arena, though. They had, uh, Jeff had, and Matt had put up plastic in the woods, like six-foot-high plastic, black plastic, and painted it with graffiti. It looked like an arena. When you walked inside of that, it looked like an arena. And they had matches, and they would film these matches. Shannon Moore was about this tall at the time. He was nine years old. Yeah, bless his heart. He still I, I, th I think he was six years old. Yeah, he probably was. He was six <laughs> years old. And uh, anyway, he was the he was the camera guy. But uh, anyway, um, I went out there, man, and I uh, just fell in love with it, man. We started doing some shows. But they would take these. What they would do was have matches on the trampoline and sell them to the local video stores. Back when we had video stores, you could go rent videos. He'd sell them to the video store in Vass, close to us, next to Cameron, and they would rent the tape out. And I'm like, wait a minute, this joker's already, he, he's, he's an entrepreneur, I'm telling you. He's on every social media thing you can be on, but uh, he's always stayed relevant for 30 years, and he's always had that mindset. Matt Hardy's a workhorse, and he kept it all together oh, yeah. for 30 years, still got it together, and uh, I just applaud him for what he's done and what he did for us, man. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah, so... Uh, the ECWF, the East Coast Wrestling Federation, is a big launching point for Omega, and that, of course, uh, founded in co-part with the late, great Tracy Cadell, somebody that meant a lot to all of you up here on the stage, the father of WWE star Cameron Grimes, for those unaware. Uh, he was a, a true founding member here. Uh, Ted, I want to throw this over to you because I know yes, ECWF was something you were very involved with and in helping promote. Oh, I was when, when did, uh, yeah, look at Thomas has some artifacts over there, Matt. I'm not sure if you've seen those. Uh, I did. One of the many gimmicks I tried, I came up with to try and make money in the business, and I've never made a cent. <laughs> <laughs> I know how you feel. <laughs> uh, but when, when you come across this, what took you about them? What attracted you to sure. wanting to be a part of this? Well, let me, let me, yeah, if I could t tell a, a short story here. And it differs. It, Matt's told part of this story before about the first match in ECWF. Matt and I remember it differently. He probably remembers it correctly, but I'm going to tell him the story the way I always tell it anyway, so don't stop me. <laughs> so I, Go I, nuts. <laughs> so I was uh, getting out of graduate school where, where I wrote my master's thesis on wrestling. What a surprise. And uh, my mom lived in Vass, which is in Moore County around Cameron and all that. And she said, oh, well, there's, there's uh, a wrestling show coming up the week after you get home. Uh, do you want to do you wanna go get tickets? And I was like, I don't know. Well, yeah. she says, well, there's an autograph session going on down at, where was it, at Mini Mart or something like that. And I said, well, go down there and s see who it is and see what's going on. So she goes down to the Mini Mart, and there's Matt Hardy and Tracy Cadell, the, the two men who created ECWF. God bless Tracy Cadell. And... Uh, Mom says, oh, I hear you're putting on a wrestling show. Uh, my son's into wrestling. Can I get your autographs? I'm like, uh, sure, but they didn't have any pens. <laughs> now, now he's always got a pen, but mom had to give him a pen. There was a learning curve back then. <laughs> and she took a picture of him, and, and when uh, Tracy passed away, that was, that was the first picture ever, I think it was the first picture ever taken of Tracy in wrestling, is uh, him, him signing me an autograph, so that was good. So we, so we go to the show, at the uh, Southern Pines National Guard Armory, and I walk in, and as you've heard before, they started off in trampoline wrestling, and then they used the trampoline ring, but they put boards across it, but it was swayed like that, horrible looking, didn't have a canvas, had a blue tarp across it, so it looked like a swimming pool. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. I look to my left, and there's this kid who's ab about, I think he was about this tall now, Shannon Moore, uh, selling Xeroxes of color photographs that you couldn't tell who was who in it. I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. This is really rinky-dink. This is really bad. And then the first match, and this is where we differ, this is the way I remember it, the first match, they said, was uh, this guy named Willow the Wisp. He comes out in sneakers, Zubaz pants, we all know Zubaz, and a ski mask. <laughs> Not suspicious at all. Uh, this is not good. Uh, and then they say, and ladies and gentlemen, his opponent, high voltage. And the door gets kicked in, and um, he does his Jimmy Garvin, yeah, 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 bit. Comes running out, trips over the mat that we had outside. 
his glasses go falling off and spin around. I, I swear they fell right at my feet. He's, and he, he's on his face on the concrete. And I'm like, I turn to my mom, I'm like, you think we can get our money back on this? <laughs> this ain't good. But then I watched a match with Matt Hardy versus Jeff Hardy. Can you imagine? And how, how old were you all then? Uh, I would guess at that time, that was in 1993, correct? Yeah. Uh, we would have been, uh, I, I was 16 or 17, 17 yeah. probably, and uh, Jeff would have been 14. Yeah, so kids. But they were yeah. just, they were, they, I immediately, you, you saw what you all know is the ultimate in talent, even at that young age. And at that time, Matt's fin finisher was the megahertz, a, a sort of a line saw type thing. But he, in the middle of the match, he did a 450. Now at that time, I knew about wrestling from around the world. At that time, only two people in the world were doing the 450. Hayabusa and Two Cold Scorpio. And this kid over here. Hitting it perfect in his brand new heavy boots. Yeah, they were heavy. Big yeah. rib. Now, the, fir the first boots I ever got uh, actually weighed 12 pounds. <laughs> they were absurd. What? And that was the first night you wore them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they had, uh, if, you know, if you know about Omega, they had, it was sort of unusual. They had live commentary during the show, like in the room. You could hear it over the PA, live commentary. And I, and I hope, hope the guys aren't here tonight, but they weren't, the guys they had weren't that great. You know, oh, look at there, come up on the top rope, hit him with his duplex. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> 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 now, now I had already, I'd already been quote unquote in the business to a certain extent for five years at that point. And I had done a lot of radio and a lot of graphic design. So I walked up to Tracy Cadell after the show and I said, hey, you guys are amazing. You got so much talent up and down this show, but uh, you need a little help graphically and a little help vocally. And Tracy was like, oh, I don't know. I'll have to talk to Matt. But then he talked to Matt, and uh, for the next, what, five, six years, I was the uh, voice of the ECWF, New Frontier Wrestling, and Omega. How about that? Uh, wh one thing I want to uh, add into this real quickly, just so we don't miss this piece of the puzzle. Uh, there, there was a guy we met who, actually Tracy Cadell, Cameron Grom's father, who helped me start Omega in the beginning, uh, met this guy named Kenneth Morgan, who was a, a, a carny. That was literally his job, who worked at fairgrounds and whatnot. And he said, you know, I've been thinking a lot, Matt. I think we can make a lot of money with this wrestling. I know you have a trampoline ring. I have one ring that's like half a real wrestling ring, half trampoline. You guys can do all your flips and everything else. And the very first show that we did was on October 15th, 1992, at the fairgrounds. And I remember we all wrestled like three times. We all had, <coughs> we all had masks. We, it was a... Uh, a show full of gimmicks where we all wrestled multiple times as different characters and personas. And uh, I, I think that is the match I referenced first. The, the very first match on that show was Matt Hardy versus Wolverine, Jeff Hardy, so to say. High voltage okay. versus Wolverine. But uh, we met Ted at our very first show. Once we bought the ring from Kenneth and we converted it to a hard ring, and it, it, it was the shit, so I'm going to be honest. You sort of converted it. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it really was. So we, we, were just, we were young kids trying to make it. Yeah. And, uh, and we made that ring, but we went out, and, and it was very cool because Ted did recognize how much natural talent was like on our roster that we had that night. And he was so beneficial and made us so much more professional in so many ways, which he was a great addition to it. We're going to take a quick pause here, Matt, because... As we've discussed, it's the holidays. If you're listening to this, you've probably already gotten your Christmas plans underway or whatever you're doing for the holidays to celebrate. But there's still the New Year's. And, and we know that's a big feast. That's a big celebration. Yeah. And what if you want to do it up big, Matt Hardy? Maybe a little surfing turf, perhaps? Oh, boy. I know the perfect spot to get it from. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, John? Oh, I think I'm thinking what you're thinking. I'm talking. Jimmy's famous seafood. Yes, sir. This is one of your favorite spots, isn't it? it? It is. It is my favorite spot. It is my favorite restaurant. And the the most amazing thing about it is that Jimmy's famous seafood, they will come to you. You yes, can purchase in order to get any of their wonderful entrees. You can get any of their wonderful seafood, any of their wonderful sushi, any of their wonderful surf and turf, and they will send it directly to you. 
jimmysfamousseafood.com is the place my friends they ship mm -hmm. food nationwide here in the united states and for free two-day nationwide shipping on orders of over 125 dollars excluding steamed crabs and fresh items you just got to use the promo code hardy what are we talking here we're talking maryland crab kinks soup mm. chowders oysters signature steaks desserts gluten-free items they got packages to make this easy, Matt Hardy. Yes. So hear me out here. There's the famous gift box, which includes four of the world's best. And you will attest, they are the best colossal Maryland crab cakes ever, aren't they? Absolutely. Their, their crab cakes are life-changing. I, I don't say this as a line. This is this is legitimate. They are life-changing. And, and I would know how great the quality is of this food that you get, because I'm a longtime customer of Jimmy's Famous Seafood and, and, and their mail order. Two different crab soups crab dip, seafood seasoning, yeah. and their signature bay sauce, or there's like the tailgate bundle if you're looking for mm -hmm. the NFL playoffs are coming up here. Two pounds of wings, full rack of barbecue ribs, pint of crab dip, oh. and crab cake mix. <sighs> I'm and it's hungry right now. Dude, it's like one in the morning as we tape this, and I'm salivating. I am <laughs> I'm so yes. hungry, and I'm ready to go to town right now because of Jimmy's famous seafood seafood or the best part is you can create your own package however you want to do it they even have a package for triple d guy fieri because he visited there yeah. and they created a package just off of what he is ordering i think that is the coolest thing ever yeah. uh, especially for a business that has been around for more than 40 years at this point and they are hooking the extreme life of matt hardy viewers and listeners up jimmy's famous seafood.com free two-day nationwide shipping on orders of $125 or more, just use that promo code Hardy. I can't think of a better way to celebrate the new year than this. I mean, it's the best Christmas gift you can give. I mean, uh, even if it's a little after Christmas, it is worth sending. People will appreciate it. It'll, it'll make a great New Year's gift. And you can start a brand new Jimmy Seafood diet. It can be your New Year's resolution. Mm, I'm not upset about that. I think that definitely... That, that's definitely my more my cup of tea <laughs> here, here than anything else. Jimmy's Famous Seafood.com, promo code Hardy. Order yours today. Thanks, Caprice boss. Coleman, ice. Give us some perspective here of what the independent wrestling scene in the territory looked like at the time and what drew you to this group of guys. Well, I have to be honest. Um, I heard about, uh, I guess, Omega when it was TWF because I was one of the kids that was renting the videotapes at Sand Hills Video um, when Matt, I guess, was, was selling them there. And so I already knew who High Voltage was. I knew who Wolverine was and Itch and all those people. <laughs> like, I was already a fan. And so um, I saw somebody putting up a flyer one day for another wrestling event and commando what's his name and, <laughs> and he was telling me about wrestling i said well i wrestled all the way through high school man i want to be one of you guys he said well we train here we train there whatever so i didn't even know there was a such thing as independent wrestling like o omega or, or matt and jeff were the first people i saw doing pro wrestling outside of like tv and so when I pulled up uh, to their yard the first time, it was the first time I saw a wrestling ring. I didn't care what it looked like. And, and I had already saw Matt and Jeff on the videotape. So then seeing them in real life, I was like, oh man, that's how he looks at without face paint on. I felt like I had stepped into like a warp room or something where I knew the secrets, you know? And so, uh, so I didn't know what the independent scene was uh, until we started doing our shows. And then we started going to other shows and we were so much ahead of our times that we were like uh, looked at, I guess the way we look at the Young Bucks now, and it's all oh, these boys, they do too many flips, they do this and they do that, they can't work a hole, they, they the flip guys and they the spot guys, the spot monkeys or whatever. That was us, you know, because everywhere else they had leg drop finishers and clothesline finishers and power slam was the finisher and or whatever like that. And we're like, well, I come off the top ropes and I turn and I do this and I do a megahertz and I do, that was us. You know, and so my introduction to the independent circuit was almost as if I was living on a high hog with my rich parents and then going home to my uh, 
to a family reunion and everybody lives in a deep, deep country or something. That's, that, that's kind of, I was like, wow, you know, we, we, we got this thing on wrap. So I really thought I was working for like the next WWF. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that day you came out. And I remember your dad was there, so supportive of doing that thing. Uh, we, it's funny, right before Caprice had showed up, we were starting to train people and it was like a $20 tryout fee or whatever. And we were like very, we were very generous to them in the beginning. And this one guy went out and said, yeah, I went and did that wrestling. Like, it's all, it's all bullshit, you know, whatever. You know, those guys. And we said, okay, no more of that. These guys, they, they've got to pay the piper if they come to, to be trained now. And he was one of the first recipients of that. So he was getting in. We had him like taking bumps right from the jump, which is very hard if you've never done it. And uh, one of the, honest to God, this is a funny story, but it's one of the sweetest things I've ever saw. Uh, his pops who was there with him, he said, you can do it, son. And, and, and Caprice was almost like, oh, no, don't do it. It's almost like you'd say to your dad. He said, here, hold out your hands. And he gave him, he had a, a fountain drink, and he gave him ice, and he put in his hands and closed his hands up and put it together. He said, your ice, you can do it, son. You can do it. One of the sweetest things ever. Uh, but, but it was great. That does. That, that does deserve a round of applause. Great having these guys and meeting these guys. Uh, it, and then there was a time where we had met this one individual. Uh, his name was Jens Lutz, and he, uh, he took interest in the stuff we were doing, and he wanted to invest in us, and he wanted to give us some money. He was a guy who actually ran a video store and, you know, claimed to have lots of money, and he wanted to, like, be our investor to a degree in the beginning. And, uh, Ted, do you have any fun stories about Jens you would like to share? I got one, yeah. Well, I mean, there's the famous story of how, you know, he's just basically a, a wrestling fan with more money than sense, and so yeah. he, he wanted... And uh, he figured if he bought into the organization, we'd let him wrestle. And so he put a hood on, and it was in a tag team match. And uh, he's out there waiting for the tag and uh, pacing around and fell off the ring. <laughs> so, that, so, so that was exciting. But my favorite one is, is you, you've all probably heard, if you follow the podcast, you, you know the story that we kept the ring in Tracy's backyard. And... Um, so every show, we'd have to d dismantle the ring, put it on a truck. And, and I, f I forget how we used to move the, the ring around in the early days, but when Jens came along, he said, oh, I got a truck. Well, you know, I'll, I'll pull it. So we hooked up a, a trailer to his truck, loaded all the, you know, and it, they're heavy, you know, those posts and everything weighs a lot. Put it all on the post or put it all on the trailer. And everybody else had gone. I think you were gone, too. I think everybody else, it was just me and Jens back there finishing up. And he, uh, he said, all right, I'm going to go now. And he goes to pull out, but he doesn't pull out the driveway. He just goes through the ditch. And he says, oh, no, I can do it. I, I got a really good truck. He'll go through this ditch. Oh, it went through the ditch just fine. But the trailer bounced off the hitch and slammed through the back of his truck. And I laughed and laughed. <laughs> well, uh, to, to tie that up pretty quickly, too, gents, he, he wanted to wrestle, but I, I think he thought he was going to, like, turn around a lot of money in this. And... Uh, it, it, if, you, if you don't know, in wrestling, especially independent wrestling, it's not a, a get-rich-quick type of thing. And uh, there, there came a point, he said, all right, guys, I'm out. He said, uh, if you guys want that ring back, it's going to cost you $1,000. And he, had, he literally held our ring hostage. And we had to collect these funds, all broke little kids. And, and eventually we got stuff together. We had been working for other promotions at this time. And one of those was uh, a gentleman named Mitch Gowd. It was ACW. And that is where we met uh, Thomas Simpson. And uh, we got to the point where Mitch Gowd had told us, he said, I'm going to tell you guys this, you know, Matt, Jeff, Jason, Marty, he said, you guys work with me and I'm giving you a good push, but I'm going to tell you this right now. If you keep going to WWF and you keep doing jobs or the guys beat you up there, he said, that's all I can use you for on my TV is just to beat you as well. I was like, oh, well, I don't know. They're like, they're paying us really well. And, you know, they, they think we have a future and we have an opportunity to do stuff and we continue to work hard. And he said, well, that's what's going to happen if you work here. And I said, okay, well, our crew will leave. And that included Shannon Moore. And then Thomas was a member and worked with Mitch, one of the investors in the promotion. And Thomas said, if, uh, if, th if this crew leaves, I'm out as well. And uh, lo and behold, that is when we met Thomas Simpson. He became our official investor, someone who had money and wasn't yeah. going to hold the ring hostage. So with that said, Thomas, why the hell drop a bunch of money on a bunch of strangers? Well, I believed in them. I mean, I, you know, the first time I met them was with the ACW. It was March 30th of 1996. And we were doing a TV taping in Candor, North Carolina. And uh, I'd seen them on TV on WWF. And, uh, but just that style they wrestled. I was big into, like, I like the Japanese wrestling and things. So, 
And then we got to become friends over the year, and it was 97 when all this stuff went down. So it was just the right time to to do it. And I mean, I'd been in, you know, in, I guess what, three about three years in then? But uh, it was, I mean, they were special. You could see they were special. I mean, you, you knew it. And everybody, and James McCone, he's out here. James, stand up and say, James was my referee at ACW. Right, this is right. James McCone. There he is, what's up, man? And James. James uh, will agree they were special. Everybody knew they were special. So, I mean, it was just a wise investment, I thought. And, you know, 25 years, here we are. So, And y'all will say, I, this was my idea today. And there were other people that we, we had planned. And life gets in the way, folks. That's all I got to say. Life gets in the way for all of us. So, But thank y'all for coming out. And y'all need to talk, not me. <laughs> Can I say something real quick about the? Uh, so we're talking about three different organizations here: the East Coast Wrestling Federation, New Frontier Wrestling Alliance, and uh, Omega. And uh, we changed the. I, th I think this is true that we changed the name for e of ECWF because there was a small group called ECW in Philadelphia that a few people <laughs> were watching. Correct. And so we decided to change. Who the that. hell are they? Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, what, we all know that Matt is one of the best wrestling minds in the business. He, he can run the business like nobody, nobody can. Uh, but he's also very generous. I had a couple of ideas of a couple of matches to book, and he, he, let, me, he let me do that. And uh, he also let me come up with the name of the new organization after we changed it from the ECWF. So that's where we came up with new, He let me do New Frontier Wrestling Alliance. And I did the low. The, if you see the New Frontier Wrestling Alliance, I have stickers of it if anybody wants them. But. Uh, there, there's a guy doing a moonsaw, and that's traced off of Matt Very doing cool. the megahertz. And then when he came up with Omega, and he came, we all came together, and he announced the new name of the organization. He said, "Oh, it's the it's the organization of modern extreme grappling arts." And I was like, "That oh wow." <laughs> But let me tell you, it grows on you. It, it does. <laughs> and Matt, if I'm not mistaken, that came to you as an epiphany. It did, like in a, in a dream one night. And I, I remember telling Thomas, that I thought, like, I think this will work. Because I was looking for something different. I loved the whole idea behind the New Frontier Wrestling uh, Alliance just because it was so different. And nothing else sounded like that. And then even Omega, I tried to do something that was so different and make you stand out from the rest of the pack. Um, and also during this time, while we were going to WWE, we were still working with the Italian Stallion as well. And I'm sure all you guys know the iconic George South, who's a staple of WrestleCade weekend. Did George um, South get his new photo with you so he can sell it at his gimmick table? He hadn't no? yet. I better find him a day. Okay. I don't want. I don't want to have to eat with George. Uh, it, I'll never forget the very first time uh, I went to WWE. I went and wrestled one of his guys, and then we had Marty, we had my brother, we had Jason and Shannon. They went. and They had a, a tryout, so to say. You know, not not being paid, just a tryout. See if they could go to uh, to WWE and, and work as an extra. And uh, the first Je the first match that Jeff actually wrestled was against George South. And, like, they got in there, and they locked up, and, like, George started calling us by. He said, all right, brother. He said, headlock, tackle, drop down, get it again. You got it. And Jeff was like, what the fuck? I, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, that was early oh, on in the day. Oh, right. By the way, they haven't been professionally trained. Yeah, right. We haven't. We were just guys who emulated what we saw on TV, which was, you know, which was amazing. But, but they were great. Along the way uh, is where we met Jamie Tucker here as well because he was a sta he was a, uh, a referee for the Italian Stallion. and he ended up coming to Omega and he fit in great. So I thought that'd be a good introduction to Jamie right here. How is everyone? So I met uh, Matt, Jeff, Marty, um, a host of guys working for the Italian Stallion and George South. Uh, probably around 94, I think it was, because you were going to TV with them and all that good stuff. Um, but, you know, from the get-go, these guys were nothing but phenomenal, great human beings. You know, I became really good friends with them. Um, you know, Stallion and them, you know, they are really corny. Um, that, that was my break, though. I started in 93 with them. But when I went over and started working with Matt, it was New Frontier, I believe, at that time. And I started refereeing their shows there, and um, Ted came up with a. Ted came up to me and said, he actually asked me, "Do you mind if I announce you tonight?" And I'm like, "No, you know, go ahead, do whatever you want to do," because you know, normally for Stallion and them, referees really wasn't recognized. We were just part of the show. Well, that's that's true of the whole business, really. Yeah. 
So Ted took it to a whole new level, and he gave me this moniker, Mr. 2020. Because referees are usually blind. <laughs> Not Jamie Scarlett. And um, changed my, my whole name, changed my last name for me. He's like, do you mind? I'm like, no, do whatever you want. Let's, let's do it. And uh, you want to go more in depth of how we, you went into that? Well, uh, just in general, if, if anybody out there works in wrestling now, thinking about working in wrestling, you, you ever have anything to do with it, people never recognize the announcer, the commentator, the referees. Nobody cares. But we all work hard. So on my very first day with the ECWF, I turned to the referee and I said, what's your name? And he says, Billy? I go, no, 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 no. What, what's your work name? What's your wrestling name, brother? And he says, what? <laughs> I said, all right, I'm going to announce you. I'm going to give you a little credit here. And I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the senior official for the ECWF, the one and only Billy Shears, which nobody got the joke. It's a Beatles reference, but uh, what, what do you want? And uh, uh, ever since then, I was like, None of the referees we ever had, we had a lot of good referees, Kenny Hotshot Henderson, um, J Jamie Scott, none of them had working names. And I said, I I'm going to give you a little bit of credit, and we're going we're gonna to get you a round of applause or disdain or something. And so, yeah, I made up names for most of the guys. That's a, uh, another great thing about Matt is Matt let me do anything I want on commentary. A lot of guys came to, to wrestle for us and didn't have any backstory. And Matt was like, just make up whatever you want to make up. And so I just I did whatever. Yeah, I, I was very open. I, wa I wanted talent to do whatever they wanted to do or just, just, just go out and have a, a good segment, whatever it is. And it's so funny. We're talking about referees. Whenever Caprice first started and he drained, we had a thing where we had people ref to begin with. And I remember it was a match and he was refing. And I just told guys, like, take your entrance music to the guy who's playing the music, the DJ, whatever. And I'll never forget, <laughs> Caprice was going out for one of his first contests, and he was the referee. And all of a sudden, they hit theme music, dun, 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 and the ref comes out, and he's doing this, and he's like <laughs> dancing and, and styling. And then he grabs the top rope and does a front flip over and lands like, hey ya! And I was like, I was like, brother, <laughs> brother, just save that for the wrestlers. Do that when you wrestle. That's a little too much of a ref to do. <laughs> You're going out still on the show, which was an amazing story. Looking back in hindsight. Okay, Matt. So earlier we were talking about Jimmy's famous seafood and you're indulging in the feast. And why wouldn't you? It's the holidays. You deserve to treat yourself. Yeah. But New Year, New Year's resolutions. A lot of people like to try to get started on the right foot. And a lot of people do so with our friends over at Athletic Greens with AG1s. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about one delicious scoop of AG1 and you are absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day and your new year right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of those things. Matt, how is AG1 going to help you get 2023 going? It is the one. Uh, AG1, much like it helped me get through 2022, it is going to help me exceed what I did in 2022 in 2023. Every morning I get up, the very first thing I put on my empty stomach is a bottle of AG1s. And it's easy. It's simple. You mix it with a bottle of water. You shake it up. You sip on it and drink it. It's great tasting. And you'll love it. And it just starts your day off right. If you start your day with AG1s, I promise it's going to be a better day. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him hundred dollars a day so he created athletic greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutritional plan for yourself and the beauty of it is this doesn't cost you a hundred dollars a day this costs you less than three dollars a day you're investing in your health it's cheaper than your cold brew habit or the iced tea you run down to wawa to get it's cheaper than getting all the different supplements yourself it is an all-in-one nutritional insurance investment and right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Just one scoop, as Matt said, in a cup of water every single day. And that's it. No need for a million different supplements and pills to look out for your health. It's all in one. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D. And how many free travel packs, my friend? Five, cinco, five, cinco, five free travel packs. And I have to say, too, uh, you know, years ago, when I was uh, in WWE in 2009, 2010-ish, uh, there was a point where my intestines broke through my abdominal wall. And whenever they had to get packaged back in and sewed up and everything else, I had 
gut issues as well. It was really hard for me to digest red meat. And I still think that lingers around a, a lot. I've improved, obviously, over the years. And I don't try to eat as much red meat as I used to, obviously, back in the day. But AG1s is perfect for my gut health. And I can really tell it's beneficial. And that's why I take it every single day. And I recommend you do as well. And all you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash hardy. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash hardy to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Oh, my God. J- Jamie, did you ever do a flip? No, I assume not. Okay. <laughs> that would be a big no. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just need to make sure on that. Uh, well, so I, I want to ask you guys about the camaraderie and the bond that formed between all of you guys. And, uh, Marty, I want to start with you first, actually, on this, because you, you've known Matt and Jeff for so long here. Uh, those first few Omega shows, as you see these super hungry guys, and I know you were part of that group of hungry guys who really wanted to make something of yourselves and become pro wrestlers. What was that bond between you all like? Well, it's, it's, if, if you've never been in the wrestling business, you don't know that bond of brotherhood that you feel for people because you're in there trusting these guys with your life. You're going to do a 450 splash. You're going to do a 450 splash on me, and I'm expecting you to hit it and not crush my face with your knees or whatever, or I'm jumping over the top rope and doing a front flip onto some concrete, and you're going to catch me. You know, one night I went up to Matt. I'll never forget this, man. I said, Matt, I got an idea for the show. Me and him were working the main event in Omega. I said, what if uh, I just come up with this on a ride over there? I said, what if I set up a table beside the ring and I set another one on top of it and I light the bottom one on fire with lighter fluid and I, we put you on top, me and a couple of guys put you on the top table so the bottom table is burning with fire. I put a chair in the ring, I run across, I jump out of the chair onto the top rope, I do a front flip out, hit both tables and put us both through the floor. He goes, yeah, let's do it. And I'm like, <laughs> I never, we never practiced it one time and and that's the kind of bond we had. He said, let's do it. And he said, you think you can hit it? I said, yeah. And we hit it perfect, man. And we hit it so well. After I hit it, I didn't even sell it. I jumped up, and I was like, yeah. And I went, oh, my back. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, that's the kind of bond it is, man. I, I, mean, I just want to interrupt here with that, that particular spot, Marty. So, th- like I said, we had live commentary at the show. So my table is right up against the ring. I'm doing the commentary. This joker has his, his uh, champagne security, set the tables up about three feet away from me, and then set them on fire. They don't, they don't tell me this stuff. <laughs> I just find out about it during the show. And, and I'm calling, oh, champagne off the top, goes through all through the flames and surges down. And then, you know, we finish the match. We're coiling up the cables afterwards, dump this man in the ring. Ted, Ted we warned your reaction to be organic. <laughs> <laughs> Omega prided itself on authenticity. <laughs> And then this, uh, but then this kid comes running up to me, a little tiny kid running up to me. He's like, he's like, they, they did that, 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 all that fire in those tables right next to you. You could have gotten hurt. I was like, you know what? You're right. Marty, what the hell are you doing, boy? <laughs> uh, speak, speaking of camaraderie, uh, uh, this reminds me of a great story. There, there were two gentlemen uh, that we met along our way. Like we had our, we were all from central North Carolina. And we met some guys that lived in eastern North Carolina, so to say. Some of you guys may have heard of uh, the Hurricane Chain Helms. Big favorite here in North Carolina. And then also his pal was uh, Mike Maverick. And they wrestled together as the serial thrillers. And we, we had met those guys on some indie shows. And they were very like-minded, like, like all, all of us were. So we thought they would be a perfect fit. So we actually invited them to Omega. And the very first show they did for us was one of the early Omega shows. And I know everybody here remembers this very well. The night before they did a show, and uh, the Raging Bull, Manny Fernandez, happened to be on that show. And uh, he said, hey, they were at a restaurant grabbing time in the air. He said, hey, where, where are you guys booked at tomorrow? Where are you guys booked at tomorrow? And they said, uh, we're booked in, in Stanford with, with o- Omega. He said, Stanford? You booked in Stanford? Is that what you said? <laughs> me, me too. Me too. What, what building is that? What venue is that? And they're like, I don't think you'd be booked there. It's not really a show that you would do or you would be on. He said, no, no, I'm booked there. I'm booked there. And then uh, Manny Fernandez, who was very well known for kind of like bullying his ways on the shows and, and doing whatever he could do to, to make a dollar in that day. Uh, Mike and Shane, they show up at our show that day, and we're just getting to know them. So, hey, we just want to tell you in advance. We want to give you the heads up. Like, 
I think Manny Fernandez is going to show up today because he was like he wasn't booked today and he was looking for a booking. So I think he's going to be here. And it's I, I'm, you know, run the show. 18 year old Matt Hardy, a little kid who's you know with Manny Fernandez, a guy who I've seen on TV. Who there's been all these legends of him pulling guns on people on indie shows for the last few years, and that's all I've heard about this guy, right? So he ends up showing up that day, and he has his bag, and he starts walking. And he says, "Hey, where's our, where's my dressing room?" And I'm uh, I was like, oh, "Okay, guys, I'll I'll take care of this. I'll handle this." And I remember going out to Manny, and uh, as Manny was sitting there, I said, hey, how, how are you, sir? It's nice to meet you. Uh, my, my name's Matt Hardy, and you know, I'm the guy who booked this show. I, I book all the talent. I book all the matches. And I'm, I'm sorry there was some sort of confusion, a mistake, like you, you weren't booked here. I said, because uh, you know, I book everyone. He said, no, I'm booked here. Henry Dean booked me here. And I said, well, Henry, Henry Dean doesn't book for this at all. I, this isn't our show. There's no more money. Uh, allocated to to pay anyone anything so I can't help you out and I'm so sorry we showed up and there was a miscommunication he said oh no he said I'm gonna get paid I'm gonna get my money or somebody's gonna get their ass whooped and then he got right up in my face nose to nose he said and it might be you and then me I'm I'm going like holy shit and I go I'm, I'm so sorry you feel that way sir <laughs> uh, but 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 there's no more money to pay anyone and, and then about this time, I saw, like, beside me, here's Marty, right by my side. Here's Jason. Here's Caprice. Here's my brother. Everybody's lining up. And he said, he said, so, all right. He said, so, so what are we going to do here? And uh, Shane and Mike were over by Manny saying, you weren't booked here. Then all of a sudden, they, like, flipped sides. And it was, like, all of us in a line, like a wall, showing brotherhood with Manny on the other side. He said, okay, maybe there was a mistake. But can I, can I at least set up my gimmick table, brother? Maybe make a couple bucks. I said, sure, yes, set up your gimmick table. That'd be great. I just, I don't have any money to pay you, so, so go nuts. But w once again, that's how like everybody got together and, and stood up. Hey, Matt, I do want to add to this. So I remember that, and of course, I'd heard stories in South Carolina about Manny having a gun on him, right? So I was freaking out at that point. But Jason came back and said, and I, I found this out later, Jason was always armed. Venom, Joy Abs, he was always armed in the locker room and stuff. And I became friends with Manny Fernandez later. Jason had a bigger gun. So, well, J yeah, Jason, yeah, 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 Jason had a, a, a hell of a lot better gun than what Manny had. J Jason's real, Jason's real job was a tow truck driver. He worked for his family, so he he ran into a lot of shady characters. So he probably did have something on him at the majority of the time, just and, for his safety. And I remember that slightly differently because uh, it was just me and Jason in the dressing room and Manny Fernandez walked in and I didn't think you knew anything about who he was other than TV stuff so he walks in on the first thing I think is I know I know his reputation and so the first thing I think is oh shit and then I said I, I said Jason go talk to him for a bit and so Jason keeps him busy and I go find Matt and I'm like Matt Manny Fernandez is here he thinks he's booked and he goes oh let me go talk to him I was like now let me explain to you about Manny Fernandez. Right. He's, he, 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 he will go crazy. And Matt, like you said, it was a, just a kid at the time and handled it like a pro businessman. It was amazing. Manny Fernandez is now a janitor at a La Quinta. That is a shoot. Well, <laughs> it, what, one story, when, when Jeff and I were on the road for WWE, there was a time where we flew into Charlotte before getting home and it, we ended up checking into a, a La Quinta. And, uh, and Manny Fernandez said, oh, hey, brother. He was working there. He said, remember that time I tried to bully my way onto your show and you didn't let me? That was great. You stood up for yourself, kid. <laughs> he was just trying to teach you a lesson. That's no, all it was. It was. Just, uh, just tough love, guys. But Capri, so uh, you, Matt just said you were part of that big Avengers Assemble moment that happened at this Omega show. Why? You guys are young kids. Why did you feel so empowered and comfortable standing up with this group of guys that... I mean, again, teenagers, 18, 19 years old. Why was that worth it for you? You could have gotten hurt. Well, I think uh, it goes back to what, what you, the question you asked to lead everybody to, is it's the brotherhood. You know, you go in and when you meet these guys, you, you just, you fall in love, you believe in them, you, you know there's something different about them. And um, it's kind of like a group. It's like we, we're all going to do this together, you know. And um, I don't think anybody was expecting a fight, but we were just, whatever happens, we're going to do it together. And, and over the years, man, it's been over well over 25 years um, because I started with them in 95, 95, 96, and we're still friends, you know, and that just shows that it was a bond that was, that was set, that um, it was unbreakable even then. It's the stories that we can tell 
And I believe that might have been the same show my mom got involved in the match. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was the same. That was the same show. Because uh, I just I, I just went from being a referee that I was being announced and I had like a jacket and yeah is that yeah. <laughs> so and so um so I was excited and I invited my parents it's the first time my parents uh, ever came to the show whatever have front row seats and I'm wrestling sweet dreams and um and we're wrestling and he has a valet which was whoever his girlfriend was at the time <laughs> it was his wife and um. And so, a good guy, bad guy, I'm getting beat up, and as I'm getting beat up, she's kind of beating me up on the side while the referee's back is turned uh, and all. And then my mom is seeing it, and, I, and I'm selling it out, man. I'm getting destroyed by the big guy and, and by his girlfriend and all. And so he does something to me in the ring, and next thing I hear, he said, brother, I think your mom is beating up my wife. <laughs> <laughs> She so, she she jumped the rail and everything, brother. She, she, and I'm getting my tail whooped, and I looked up, and I went right back down. I said, "Yeah, that's 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 going on." And so I was like, "I, I mean, I'm hoping it's gonna disappear or whatever like that." And so, I'm, so we had to break that fight up before we could finish our fight. And he gets on the thing. He said, "You got your mom in here trying to beat us." Uh, so that was that was a definitely. Uh, a memorable, it was so many nights like that where I guess it all attests to we were all young and we all had a dream and, and, and Matt, like he, he dreamt, I was there when Matt uh, came to practice that day, he said, man, I had a dream about us changing the name to Omega. And we was like, well, what does that even mean? He was like, organization of modern extreme grappling arts. I'm like, cricket, cricket, <laughs> But But when Matt, whenever Matt believes in something, it's like, he, he believes it all the way through, and he's going to walk it through, and like you can see that even now, and that's the mindset that he had, and then he had the pictures and the drawings and this, and it's like when you see it come, you're like, dang. And so after Matt proves himself to you a, a couple of times, you, 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 it's almost like walking with Jesus. It's like, well, you don't see, don't see you turn water into wine and, and turn these two fish and five loaves of bread. I, whatever you say, man, I'm just going to walk with it. <laughs> Thomas. Hey, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, add to your story about you and Sweet Dreams that uh, so you came back because I was out there and you know, I helped settle that down and we you came back to the locker room and you were upset, obviously, right? You were, uh, you were, you were still in were you still in high school? I think I was in college because you helped me pass. I helped you math, yeah. yeah I, 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 and I'm a math professor, so that's my job. I wouldn't have graduated yeah. from college if it wasn't for him. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I, and a lot of people have said that over the years, thank God, uh, but my students. But, so, but you came back in the locker and you were upset. I, you were about to cry, and, and I remember Matt saying, he, he put your, his arm around and said, Al, I think it's about time for you to smarten up your mom. <laughs> <laughs> She still thinks it's real. <laughs> there you go. See, I, I tell her I'm going on the road, and she's like, you going to wrestle or to commentate? And I say, I'm going to wrestle. Oh, Lord, you know they really be trying to hurt people in that ring. And I say, I'm doing it 27 years, man. I think I'll be a, I say, I'm doing commentary. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You know, <laughs> people were talking about last night about the Jeff Jarrett and his nine lives. But you think about you. You are wrestling and commentating and on TV all the time now, 27 years after you started. And, and you're like more of a name now than you've ever been. And that's just um, amazing. I mean, we've all got nine lives, right? I mean, I, everybody's sitting here at this table wrestling wise. But I mean, just that's, y'all, that's just incredible. That's God, man. Yeah, um, absolutely. Matt, Matt let me come in here to train to wrestle. I was too small to wrestle. Shannon was the un, Shannon was the smallest wrestler, but like that was his gimmick too. And I think Shannon and I were close to the same age um, size. And so uh, he said, "Well, you could referee." So Jamie trained me to be a referee until I started putting size on myself. And then Matt told me when I was ready. So I went from being a referee uh, to a wrestler, and then wrestler. To on my, all my career, I've wrestled, I've managed, I've produced, I talent create, um, and I do commentary. And um, it's a blessing to have longevity in, in your dream job. You know, it, and I can't say it's anything I've done because I look at stuff back at my tapes and I look at back commentary. And I'm like, oh, I should have said this, or oh, I should have did that. Oh man, I messed that up and did that. Um, I think it's just 
it's by the grace of God, man. I, I can't say it's anything I've done. It's just being consistent and and um, showing up, and I guess it, the rest is God, man. You know, so I, I don't want to preach or anything like that, but I don't hear that in, unless somebody says that to me, and I don't even see it until you just brought it to my life, man. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for, for my career now, and I'm thankful for you, Matt, because you've never changed. You know, there's so many people that they – they get signed and, and they're done and they're a whole other person you can't talk to them you can't call them you can't this you can't that you know and um matt's always been this, my son and matt share the same birthday and matt will call him happy birthday you know it's it's just that type of brotherhood that never changes and i thank god for people on this panel that um i, I hadn't seen marty for 10 15 years and um, we worked the show a couple of months ago, man, and it's like we, we never skipped a day. Like, we never skipped a day. And, yeah, worked each other, and, and like, it's, it's, that, it's that brotherhood. And it's like everybody here, even seeing, I hadn't seen Jamie in I don't know how many years, but it's just like, it's, yeah, it was 20 years. Probably. Man, we look good. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's that, it's that. It's like seeing them, and it's like seeing a family member that you haven't seen for a long time, and that's that's amazing. Yeah, I want to add to that a little bit. I, like I said, we hadn't seen each other for 15 years probably, and uh, I knew I was going to work a priest, and I'm like, oh Lord, I'm about to do some running, buddy. And uh, but anyway, I knew he was in shape and he was ready, so I was trying to get ready. And he's 45, and I'm 54. He's black, I'm white. He preaches, I preach. I was like, you know what though? we're still brothers you know what I mean we always will be but uh, it was just so amazing to work him because I'm, I'm thinking the whole time this is the first Omega trainee right here now he is on TV working matches commentating matches I'm proud of him. Uh, Jamie Tucker he went he went to WCW uh, he was a ref at WCW for a while uh, you know all these guys on this panel have done great things man and uh, except me of course but uh, <laughs> now Ted he made these glasses Ted used to make uh, our outfits for us and Matt did too. Matt was a sewer. He sewed our tights. Ted sewed our tights. Ted made He made uh, trading cards. He, he made our first heavyweight title. He, he made it I mean, I mean he did all these things. He's created so many things. He makes masks now If anybody wants a hood, that's who you buy it from right there. They're expensive, but uh, he, he'll sell you a hood But uh, this is the first Omega belt that he made for us we didn't have any money, so this guy came up with this stuff, and it was just, he saved our life. You know How what I mean? great is that? That's awesome. It, once again, talking about the, uh, the brotherhood of all of the Omega Brothers, uh, I'll never forget, too, like, it, it was a very common process and procedure that whenever we'd have a big show anywhere, whether it was, if it was in Southern Pines or Sanford, or you know East Wake when we started doing shows up by Shane and Mike Maverick's area too, uh, we would have the show, we would all break down the ring, put it on the trailer, we would drive it back to Tracy's, leave it there, and then we would go in Tracy's house, and we always recorded the show every single night. And now it's probably 3 a.m. in the morning, and we would watch the show from beginning to end, you know, and it was probably two and a half, three hours, and we would sit there and watch it, and and then we would all be leaving, and usually the sun was coming up whenever we'd be leaving Tracy Goodell's house. And that was like our thing. It was just like a ritual. It was just a process. And, and it really showed how we believed in what we were doing and how much we loved what we were doing. Even though we weren't making money really doing what we were doing, we loved it. And we were all young kids that had these major aspirations to make it in pro wrestling one day. And we were going to see that through. Uh, Jamie, I, I'd like to ask you this. Again, you, you refereed at a very high level uh, how did refing these Omega matches, which were so intense, high energy, high flying, doing things that nobody else saw before, how did that prepare you for what you would encounter down the line? Well, uh, working with all these guys, they were really big professionals to begin with. Uh, the shows were high quality. Um, everybody put all their craft into it. Um, it wasn't like some mud, sh mud show over here at the side of the road at an armory somewhere, these guys were really talented. Um, and they had the same dream that I had. I wanted to go to the big time, and they wanted to go to the big time, and we all pushed for that. And you couldn't ask anything you see today, and I, I'll say this, I even work for these companies, the newer companies like Evolve, WWN, the, the FIP, all that. I've worked for them. 
But if it wasn't for Omega, these companies wouldn't exist, in my opinion. That's true. We are the front runners of how the, the business went. And this guy down here, we used to talk once a week. He'd call me. I was on every Omega show. And I appreciate Matt booking me. And, I, and it wasn't for these guys. Hell, I might even not even got hired myself. So I love each and every one of them. Matt. As the ringleader of sorts here, when someone would get signed or get an opportunity on national television, how much did that mean to you? I mean, that was that was huge. I mean, we had so many guys that did so many different things. I mean, you look back at obviously myself and Jeff. We ended up going to to WWE. We signed full time there. We had Shannon and Shane who ended up going to WCW. We had uh, Marty. Uh, Otto Schwanz and Mike Maverick, they went to ECW. They were working there doing their whole dubs deal. Jamie at WCW. You know, Caprice ended up doing Ring of Honor. Uh, so many guys. Steve Carino was there. Joy Matthews. Um, Christian York. And, and so many guys, like, went on to do great things. And considering it was such a small amount of talent in one promotion that actually went on to the big time, of course it was huge. I mean, it's like seeing your in, – in some ways, it's like seeing your own brother succeed. That's how it feels. You know, so with all these guys, it was so great when guys got opportunities to do things, especially us getting our foot in the door started with Italian Stan and George South again. And after we went to the first ever uh, WWF event, we got in the van. It was myself, my brother, Marty, and Jason Arndt. And uh, we drove six or seven miles away from the arena. We got paid 150 bucks that night. We thought we were like millionaires, right? We got paid 150 bucks for wrestling a match that night or being booked at the show. And we drove six or seven miles away out, a pretty remote location in the woods. And Saint said, okay, brothers, if you guys want to go to the next town, you want to make that 150 tomorrow night, I'm going to need that booking fee. That's $100. And there were 14 guys in the van. And, uh, well, we made 50 as opposed to 150 So a $100 booking fee every single night. But to us, that was worth it because we were getting opportunity to work at the big time and meet people and network and, and make connections. And what an insane success story this is. Just to try to keep this into perspective, these are all guys from the backwoods of the Carolinas who would get signed by the biggest companies in the world. The resources aren't there like they are in the Northeast, and that's where WWF had its, its roots. Atlanta was where WCW had its roots. The territories are starting to phase out at this point. So for you guys to find that success, I mean, Marty Garner became The Rock's assistant. Like, like this guy was The Rock's assistant and did a damn good job at he it. Literally traveled the world with The Rock. Some of the catchphrases The Rock had came from him. That's a fact. I said something to Rock on a movie set of Walking Tall one night. He, he was. We always cut up with each other, and he said something. And I said, "Man, how's your lips doing?" He said, hey, they're doing pretty good. I said, well, I'm about to slap them out of your face. And he just died. He goes, dude, I got to put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> so uh, we went back to WWE for one little thing, a couple little things or whatever. And he out, went to his house in California one night. And he says, uh, we're getting ready to go to a, uh, a party. He said, but uh, here you go. I'm going to show you something. Threw me a shirt. And on the front, it was a WWE shirt. It says, how's your lips? And on the back, it says, because I'm about to slap them right off your face. <laughs> and I'm like... Wow, I got a shirt at WWE, man. <laughs> and, and it went to dump number one bestseller that week. So anytime you would hear The Rock say a catchphrase or something, he'd go, Champagne! <laughs> That's what we were talking about. Surely yeah. you got the residual checks for that no, T-shirt. I, right? I did not. I did not. <laughs> my, uh, yeah, my, my residual check was I was on payroll. So uh, that, that was my residual check. But uh, that, that was a blessing, man. I had a good time with that dude, man. I watched him become a high chief of Samoa. I was at the ceremony, and I'm like, how many people in the world get to sit and watch The Rock become a high chief of Samoa? We were in front of 50,000 people one night in Samoa. I walked on the stage, there was 50,000 people, and they were on buildings and trees and everywhere, and it was, it was unreal. I'm getting goosebumps telling that story. It's but amazing. Uh, I could talk for hours about that, but it was a blessing, man. I had a good time with that dude. He's a great man, and, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. For, for any of you out there to say, oh, yeah, Marty's telling another story, 50,000, 60,000, someone's, yeah, right, Marty, whatever you say. That's what I said to him when he told me the story. He said, hold up, reaches around. Pulls out his photo album flips. He said, here you go. 50,000 Samoans. That's amazing. 
That's amazing. Uh, all 50,000 wasn't in that one picture, but, you know, he, he could see there's a, there's a bunch of people there. So. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Matt. What would you say was the highlight of your 2022? Hmm. I would say the highlight of my 2022 was finally getting revenge on that damn dastardly Jeff Jarrett. Mm. And on top of that, I would say my highlight would be Christmas with my family. And I make sure that my tree is trimmed perfectly. And speaking of that, <laughs> you have any idea of something we could help use to, to trim other items perfectly, John? Oh, uh, let's see. Let me mosey around here. Oh, wait. What do you know? Look what I found. Uh, what are the odds? <laughs> what are the, who would have thought? Who would have thunk it? We're talking about Manscaped here because you talked about your highlight of 2022. Well, in 2023, I am looking forward to a big, big, big time year from Manscaped. Oh, We're wow. talking about a company, Matt, that is the global leader in below the waist grooming. And they're leaving 2022 with brand new products. The Persevere Cologne and Persevere Body Wash. 2023 is the year to up your hygiene game and smell amazing. And wrestling fans, please heed my advice. That is very important. I promise you that. It's very important to up your hygiene game and smell amazing. It's Man very important. <laughs> Manscaped wants to help you do so with this special offer. Use the code Hardy for 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. You can take the leap into the new year and join the 7 million men who already trust Manscaped. And the reason they do, well, you got the mower of lawns 4.0 here, Matt Hardy. Mower of lawns? You've got the whacker of weeds. And the whacker of weeds? Both of these things are absolutely delightful. The Lawnmower 4.0 is the leader of the Performance Package 4.0, or yes. as I call it, the perfect package for my package, of course. It's engineered to have the ultimate groin and body trimmer, focusing on intelligent functionality and an incredibly comfortable grooming experience. Mm -hmm. Listen, I just me personally, I think confidence is going to be king in 2023. I think mean, that's like that's like my resolution. Yeah. And you know what else I'm pretty confident about, Matt Hardy? Smelling like a million bucks. You asked. I know you asked. And Manscaped answered, introducing the brand new Manscaped Persevere Body Wash and Persevere Cologne. Talk about being clean, feeling, smelling good. The new Persevere Body Wash from Manscaped solves all three for the perfect addition to your daily grooming routine. But in the shower, the body wash has a light woodsy scent. You know something about that in the backwoods of North Carolina. Yeah. And it Ready for this? It is infused with aloe vera and sea salt to keep your skin feeling clean, nice, and moisturized. Mm -hmm. I like that. I, I'm all about the bougie stuff. I'm all yeah. about that stuff. I think yeah. you can tell here. And the yeah. new Preserve Cologne, Matt, is like the body wash with a light woodsy scent that answers the call of the wild by leaving you smelling like a man forged from the earth. Gilbert Hardy would be proud, Matt. Ooh, the legend would be proud. <laughs> It is also cruelty-free, dye-free, paraben-free, and vegan, so you know you're in the right hands while smelling right. All you got to do is go to manscaped.com, use that code HARDY, get 20% off and free shipping. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code HARDY. Happy New Year to your balls, Matt Hardy. Yes, sir. Happy New Year to your balls, John Alba. And I got to tell you, that delectable scent, it will persevere for a long time, speaking from experience. Uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to do some uh, q and A. So if anyone has questions, start thinking about them right now. Uh, obviously, someone who's not up here with us right now is Matt's brother, Jeff, who we all wish could be with us here. I always say on the podcast that Matt is the secret sauce of the Hardy Boys. And, and Jim Ross would say, you know, Matt was the steak. Jeff is the sizzle. And I think Jeff's abilities, Matt, really played into giving that folklore of Omega and, and elevating Omega just to that next level. How critical was Jeff to the chemical compound that made up your organization? Uh, I like how you stated that. Uh, it, it, was, it was vital, paramount. I mean, Je Jeff is... Uh, Jeff is like a once-in-a-lifetime performer in so many ways. In the ways he does things, he is so special. 
He's so charismatic. And, and just as you said, and I, I don't think it's any big secret, no one really disputes this. You know, Jeff would literally come in and say, okay, well, you know, we got a match tonight, 20 minutes. Okay, cool. Matt, just tell me what you want me to do. I'll see you out there. You know, that's pretty much what our deal was. And then, then I would be the architect who would kind of orchestrate and put everything together, and then Jeff would just go out there and be a rock star. You know, that's what he does. But Jeff then, especially he was just so charismatic. He was a big Sting fan, big Ultimate Warrior fan. That's where Wolverine came from initially with the face paint and whatnot, which ended up carrying on as Jeff Hardy, the charismatic enigma in WWE and TNA. And then his performance as Willow was also something very special too. Willow, a character that was really inspired by combinations of things. Great Muda, uh, Jushin Liger, and also like uh, psychosis. That there was a lot of psychosis in that as well. But like uh, Jeff's ability to perform those characters and separate them were amazing. And I would imagine you would agree with that, Ted. Like exactly. The, the, I, I, the difference between like Jeff Hardy as Wolverine, just as Jeff Hardy, and then as Will the Wisp, it was like two different performers who wrestled two different styles, and, and they were amazing. And that, they were both huge, huge components of Omega success. Well, exactly. I always tell the story. I said, people say, oh, is, is Willow Jeff Hardy? Is Willow Jeff Hardy? I'm like, no, he's not. Jeff, Jeff Hardy is a person. Jeff Hardy plays Wolverine for us. Willow is a completely different person. When that mask goes on, he's, he's Willow the Wisp. He's the demon from down under, Willow the Wisp. I'll and say that uh, I was actually at a show. I don't. I, I want to say I was refereeing when I realized that Jeff was Wolverine. I mean, Wef was Willow. Like I didn't even practicing with these guys. I didn't know it, and they kayfabe me <laughs> about it until I was like, "Hold on a second. I'm gonna see him put this mask on. My dad gonna self. Like that's how good they kayfabe that." One of the one of the craziest Jeff stories as well. Uh, after Thomas had helped us out and invested in us, he got us some guardrails too, right? So we actually had guardrails so that Caprice's mom could jump over them, you know, and, and tackle the valet. So uh, we have these guardrails, and these guardrails were thick, solid steel. Uh, yeah, cattle railing, really heavy-duty stuff. And uh, Jeff did a, a, a springboard moonsault outside onto these people in, in a match, and Jeff's legs smashed this guardrail, and then like Bennett, this was something that seemed like unbendable, and Bennett, and like, I, I just, I thought Jeff's career was over at this point, and this was at a show in the Sanford National Guard Armory. It was the first show? Yeah. yeah. First match. First we had just gotten those rails, because we didn't have rails until Thomas came along. Yeah. Like I said, the sugar daddy of Omega. Yeah, that's it. And, and, uh, and the, the main event that night was we'd been building up an angle, was, uh, Matt Hardy high voltage or surge versus uh, Will the Wisp, and I was like, dude, we'll figure out, we'll figure out some kind of game plan. And I remember Jeff just sat back there and he laid down and said, No, I'll be okay. Let's just keep it simple. Let's keep it simple. And he went out there and he he made it through the match, and which was an incredible effort. It's just like I can't believe he didn't have knee surgery after that happened. It, it was just unbelievable that he survived that. Well, he he was wearing one of those knee pads that has a steel bar going down the side. And afterwards, he showed, but that steel bar was like bent at like a 30 degree angle. So a few years, well, when he had his motorcycle wreck and had to have his surgery. So when they were getting ready to go to surgery, they did the x-rays, Beth called me and she said, Thomas, what leg did Jeff hit on the guardrail? And I, so I had to pop in the old uh, Uncommon Passion DVD and see the match, right? And, and fast forward through it, and I told her, I think it was I th I left. She said, well, it had already been broken. So he actually broke his leg that night. And didn't know, to, and, and this is almost 20 years later. <laughs> they, they knew about, I mean, you know, toughest man on earth, y'all. Yeah, I mean, he went out and did 18 minutes with me that night, too, <laughs> with a broke leg. Well, you look at all the high flying that our guys did, and we, they almost never got injured. Uh, uh, you, they, they were rolling the dice every night and coming up, you know, 7-Eleven every night. And, uh, you know, if they did get injured, they didn't have the money to pay for it, so they just put some ice on it and went home. Jeff, one time, because once we started to get popular, people would just show up, workers would just show up and say, oh, hey, can I, can I, can I get on the card? Can I get on the card? And Matt's a generous guy. He, if he liked the guy, he, he'd give him a spot. And uh, th that's right. <laughs> so this kid, I don't even know who this kid was, but uh, he said, uh, can, Matt, can I get some work? And he said, well, yeah, I'll put you in against Wolverine. So Jeff's working this kid, and he goes for a, uh, a launching himself over the top 
to do a cross body on the kid and the kid catches him like around the hips and the thighs his body pivots and his chin hits the concrete and he finishes the match no problem and then he's got another match later on as Willow but he just disappears and then at, at, you know at intermission I go looking for him I finally find him sitting you know in the, uh, back behind the garage doors behind the armory and I said Jeff how you doing he's like I'm all right you know, my, my neck and my skull are tingling a lot. I'm like, dude, that ain't good. You need to go to the hospital. Can't do it, brother. Got another match. I think one of the most amazing things about pro wrestling, and I, I, I said this recently on the podcast, Matt, is that when an audience connects with a performer at the level of they feel with them, there's empathy, genuine empathy, genuine compassion, and they want to be part of their journey I don't think there are few people in pro wrestling who exemplify that more than Jeff Hardy. And I think that's what makes Jeff so special for so many of us here. So on behalf of everyone here, we're all sending Jeff the best and, and wishing him the absolute best. I, I agree with your sentiment too. Thank you. So uh, guys, we're gonna get into the Q&A session in just one second here, but I got one last question here to kind of bookend all of this for you guys. Uh, eventually, the Hardy Boys get signed to a full-time contract. And with that, Omega, un unfortunately, starts to fold up shop because, well, these boys are about to become big-time stars. And they eventually end up winning the WWF Tag Team Championships for the first time in North Carolina. So altogether, you got a really special moment. But when, when the Hardy Boys got signed, uh, Thomas, we'll start with you, and we can kind of go down the line here. Uh, seeing the writing on the wall for Omega, what were those emotions like? I cried. <laughs> I mean, it's a shoot. I mean, I cried. I mean, it was, I was happy, but then I knew things were about to change. And they, and they did. I mean, it's, but again, it's, they were, everybody got to live their dream. I mean, I, it's, and then, I mean, the last 25, well, I guess it's been 20 years now, uh, well, 24 years, uh, yes, but it's been fantastic. I mean, I have all these great stories about wrestling. I, somebody was, <coughs> I, you were talking about, I, your podcast is coming up where you were talking about when Jeff came back to WWE in 2006, right? And y'all tell me, I forget, we had a lot of fun that little period where y'all were back and as a tag team and stuff. But we had some really good times because I, my best stories are from on the you know going to shows with them and stuff at WWE. It's, but I mean, it's been it's been wonderful. But it was it was sad. But I still managed to stay around wrestling one way or the other. <laughs> you did. I, I, I'll never forget too when I, I we we had a show at Southern Pines Armory and I remember coming in and telling you and we were talking. I said, uh, "Man, we just got the call." Like WWE just offered their deals, and we're gonna, we're gonna end up going there. And you're like, what? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, Ooh, and congratulations! And everybody was super happy for us, and it was great. And and I love the fact that the way that we went out because we were the Omega Tag Team Champions too. We turned Hill and Shane Helms and the Hurricanes hometown, and we dropped the titles of those guys, which was a lot of fun too. And we incorporated some some Willow stuff and Hill Hardy Boys there, and we were we were damn uh, sucking up to Vince McMahon. We were going to be big stars, yeah. Yeah, that was the match, and and that's still that's uh that's one of my favorite Omega matches for sure, you know. It's iconic here. Yeah. It's probably the iconic Omega match. And it was one of our biggest houses too. We had uh, over. Like yeah, we had right at a thousand people there. Yeah, it was uh very very good stuff. Ted, do you remember those bittersweet emotions? Yeah, because well, you know, that was the end of it for me. I I, I got out of the business for, except for making wrestling masks, but uh, you know didn't announce anymore or anything like that. But, it, you know, it's nice to see your friends reaching for their dreams and making it. Because I told you that story of, the, you know, the first match I saw with them in the ECWF. And, you know, the, the minute they started wrestling, I was like, oh, these guys are going to be superstars. I got I to gotta hook on to this and get a piece of this. Uh, and we had, uh, what, uh, how long were we together? Six years, seven years together? And uh, before we went to the big, sh the big dance. And... Uh, it was nice to see you on TV. It was fun. Uh, but what really made me smile and made it magical for me was when your first action figures came out. Because that was the first time that they used the laser scanning to actually get the, the real wrestlers' features onto the action figure. And it came out, and I went down to KB Toys or somewhere like that and bought it. And I'm like, this looks just like them. These are my friends. 
and they're action figures. How cool is that? That is cool. Uh, thank you. Jamie? Well, um, I was more than happy for these guys. I mean, I saw how hard they worked for it. Um, I refereed so many countless matches of theirs, not just for Omega, but even other shows. We'd be, we'd be everywhere together, you know, over the years. And um, it was like if I got signed, that's the way I felt at that time. And shortly thereafter, you know, everybody that I knew started going somewhere and did something major. So it was really awesome. And I actually, I was there the night they won the titles. We actually went to the uh, Raw event, and that was pretty cool to actually see you guys win them live. Yeah. Really, really awesome. What about you, Caprice? Uh, I think the true meaning of, of, of taking in success is when one of your friends succeed, you succeed with them. You know, it's like we, we prosper. And I think there was an overwhelming feeling that when Matt and Jeff got signed, like we all got signed. It was like, wow, that is, it's like, then you seeing them on TV and the, and the action figures, it's like, I know these guys, you know? And for me, uh, it was never the what happens next because Shannon Moore, Shane Helms, Sweet Dreams, Jamie, I just started following them places. And then, you know, I, I think I went to um, NWA Wildside is where I went to. And that's where I started like getting my TV spots and, and all there. So. It's kind of like we just knew the world was about to change for all of us, and and to see them win the tag team titles, we knew it was that was it, that was it. And Marty, I mean, you knew these guys dating back a long time, so for all this shop to close up and see them make it, what that mean to you? I'm gonna explain this like my daddy told me one time. He said when I was young, he said I sold a lot of cars I didn't know were special. He said I should be shot for the cars I sold that would have been off the chain now getting paid for we didn't know how special omega was really we had no idea it'll never be done again i don't think i mean i, I i'm not bragging but you had 12 to 15 guys who went to major federation and did some major things and it, we were all blessed it was by blessings of god first off but it i, I don't know if it's ever going to be done again and uh, i was uh, proud to be a part of that and i think the day you got the call we were setting up the ring for an omega show weren't we they got the call that day, and I said, what? I said, oh, my heart dropped. I was like, it's over. This is over. This ride's over. And I was proud for them, but I was also envious. You know, I was, I was so happy my friends made it, but I was like, man, I, wow, it's, it's really over. And I was sad. I was really sad that night. But uh, we got past it, and everybody went on to do other things. But, uh, yeah, it, I was just blessed to be a part of it. So proud of these guys, man, what they've accomplished, man. It's just been unreal. It's like a... Almost like a dream sometimes. You're like, man, this ain't really happening to my friends. But it is. It's happened for 30 years. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been a great ride, man. Out of curiosity, was anybody here ever at an Omega show? Anyone ever attend one? Jamie How about that? Jamie Tucker's sister, Amy, out there was at every one of them. She and his, their mama, absolutely. Wow. I mean, that's so cool. I just, I'm Matt, seeing that people here were in attendance for those shows 25 years ago, uh, what does that mean to you? I mean, it's special. It's just, it really created something that will last forever. And it was one of those things. We had no idea how impactful the things we were doing were to the future of the business. It was like we, we were working the modern wrestling style before it became the modern wrestling style. Uh, so, so we were definitely ahead of the game, and, and we were game changers to a degree. And, and it really, Omega tapes and, and, and some of the crazy matches and, and crazy spots we did, like the one Marty was talking about with the two tables and the fire. I mean, that, that was like folklore, and it ended up being spread everywhere. You know, it would, just, it would have been incredible if the Internet would have been around because it would have truly been everywhere then. But even without the Internet, it ended up going everywhere. So for those of you who are like, AEW just spot fest matches and everything, Tony Khan was watching Omega. Give me the in. heat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're going to do a little Q&A. If anybody has any questions, we'll try to get to as many as possible. I'm going to hold the mic for you, but when I come to you, just say your name and uh, direct your question to whomever you may. Does anybody have a question? If you want to raise your hand, we'll start right here. Hold the mic for you. All right, Mr. Hardy, I'm a fellow North Carolinian, and I've always been told, according to Bruce Pritchard, on your first enhancement talent match in the mid-'90s, he said you were only 16 working like as an enhancement talent. Is that true or not? That, that was Jeff, and that is true. Jeff was. Jeff was 16. I, I was actually 18, and Jeff was 16. And I, I remember 
we, we asked the Italian stallion when he was taking us up there. And I said, well, my brother's 16. Is he going to be able to do it? He said, yeah, he's going to be fine. Just get a note from your dad. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. And like our dad said, our son can wrestle. And, and then uh, whenever we got there, we were filling out these forms. And it said, you know, it's specifically in bold print, must be 18. And the stallion said, uh, just move back your birthday two years, kid. Move back your birthday two years, kid. Uh, and later that was obviously uh, revealed that, you know, Jeff said he was 18. He was the same age as me. Uh, but he was 16, actually, when every first went up there. So the very first match of all of us when we were there being an extra for the very first time was Jeff Hardy, a young, pasty, 16-year-old kid who wrestled Scott Hall, who was mad. The guy who was supposed to wrestle Scott Hall, when a Stallions guy, said, Oh, brother, I'm, I got a bad neck. I can't take that razor's edge, brother. I, I can't, I got, we got to call off the match. I can't take it. He's like, What the hell? Why are you here? And then they say, oh, I got this great kid. He can bump for you. Here he is uh, right here, uh, Jeff Hardy. He's, he's great, brother. And Jeff's going, uh, hi. And now he's all mad. He's like, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And you can take this finish. You don't have a problem, do you? Is your neck fine? And Jeff said, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then they went out there and he like beat the shit out of Jeff the very first match. Little 16-year-old kid. And the second match was me versus Nikolai Volkov. And uh, Tony Gurria, who was the agent kind of for all of the extra talents the enhancement talent in those days he came up he said oh i forgot to tell all you guys he said uh do not mess up because if you go out and if you mess up a match he said you will never be invited back again you will never come back again your, your wrestling career will be over so do not mess up oh, geez okay he laid that on pretty thick and then nikolai comes up to me he says uh hi matt uh, i'll be wrestling you on tv he said very simple match just listen to me out there he said don't worry about it i mess up every match it would be fine and he walked off and i'm like well, what <laughs> i'm never gonna come back after tonight so that that was a lot of pressure right from the jump but jeff was the first one out the curtain 16 year old pasty white jeff hardy and that helped you form a good relationship with the click moving forward too it did after uh after jeff got beat up by scott hall there was a point where he Picked him up and jammed him into the, uh, into the corner, and his knee slammed against the ring post, and, and he'd heard it. And he came back and said, I'm sorry. He said, like, kind of let my temper get the best of me. This other guy pulled out of the match, and I was very frustrated and whatnot. So, sorry, you know, I, I, I roughed you up like that. I, I really apologize. Sorry about that. And then I remember uh, uh, Kevin Nash and X-Pac, they were looking at me and said, yeah, look at his haircut. And back then, Jeff was a big Vanilla Ice fan. He had his haircut like Vanilla Ice. And he said, yeah, he said, look, he does look like Vanilla Ice. It makes me want to go. Bum 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 and they go oh ice what's up and that's then they always they dug myself and Jeff and they called Jeff Ice till yeah till his last days Ice was a moniker that stuck with Jeff that's awesome anybody else questions yeah my name's Wolf and this goes to Matt how was it like working with Michael Hayes. Oh boy, it was uh, it was amazing, it, quite an experience. So I, when I came up and I was watching NWA uh, as a fan, I was a big fan. Like I, I enjoyed the original Freebirds, but I I really loved Jimmy Garvin, and uh, and Michael Hayes together. They they were great. As Ted said, I came out doing my Jimmy Garvin. Yeah, 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 and. Uh, just being paired with Michael Hayes, he buzzed us on us a couple weeks before. He said, you know, we're, he said, we're, we're going to be a team. He said, we're going to be like the damn new Freebirds, all right? You guys get ready. He said, we're brothers. He said, we do everything together. He said, we break bread together. We travel together. We stay in the damn hill of hotel room. We stay in the hotel room. You and your brother can swap who's taking the cot each night. He wasn't doing it. Uh, he said, so that's how we're going to do it. We're going to be brothers. And uh, Jeff and I, we used to be good kids before we got into the wrestling business. You know, we didn't, didn't drink, didn't do anything. And uh, the, the very first time we were traveling with Michael, we stopped at a Cracker Barrel to eat, and he came in there. He said, where's the bar? Where's the bar? And I said, well, this isn't Cracker Barrel. They don't, they don't have a bar. Michael said, well, this is bullshit. He said, we can't stop at a restaurant unless there's a bar from here on out. Because he, he had his ritual. He had his process. And then, uh, I mean, we, we bonded with Michael, but we also saw some of the insanity of Michael, too. There was one time where Michael had had a few drinks at said bar, and uh, we ran in to use the bathroom as we took a stop on the road. And oh, no. he's in the stall beside me. And he <laughs> tells me, he says, hey, Matt, Matt, watch this, watch this, watch this. And uh, he, he's holding his junk super tight, squeezing it. And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, it's Jeff next door. It's Jeff next door. He said, watch this. And he let it go. And I'm like, over the stall. And it just like, ah! <laughs> he said, that's a good old free bird rib we used to do back in Texas. So, so th there, were, there were a lot of those experiences. 
And, and Bradshaw, which I said so famously, because he, we worked with him and Ron Simmons, the APA, a lot during that time, the APA, the Acolytes. And he said, when the Hardys turn on Michael Hayes, they will kill Michael Hayes. Because <laughs> he said, I can see you guys. You're, like, super talented, and you appreciate him, you enjoy him, but he's also driving you guys nuts, too. I can see this now. So it, it was great, though, man. I, I'll say this over and over. No one has ever taught me more than Michael Hayes did. My, Michael Hayes is what – is the, is the factor that helps solidify myself and Jeff into more legitimate wrestlers and performers. A lot of the stuff he said, he said, you guys can do all these cool moves and flips, he said, but people that are watching you from the seats, looking in the ring, they have to believe that, that you can kick their ass. They need to be intimidated by you, and it needs to be believable, like whenever you're punching someone or kicking someone, whatever. And he, he helped us gain a lot of credibility when it came to that stuff and, and really tightened up our games fundamentally. And he's one of the most creative minds I've ever met. I mean, he says some ideas that are absolutely insane, but there's sometimes he says stuff you think's insane, but you're like, hold up, that actually might be really, really cool. You know, so, so he's a great mind, and no one taught me more. I, I have nothing but great love for Michael Hayes. And I can't encourage you guys enough. Head over to the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy archives. Matt, as you can tell, is just an incredible storyteller, and we've done episodes on just Michael Hayes. These reoccurring characters come up. Uh, you can check that out wherever you get your podcasts, The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. I do want to ask if we can keep our questions just related to Omega, just because we got the whole panel here. And uh, I'm sure these guys have a lot of great stuff to say. Hello, Alex from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, when you guys were starting out doing the backyard wrestling, the trampoline, that sort of thing, and then you moved on to Wrestle George South, and he's giving you all those moves and walking you through, it's like that culture shock of how you guys were doing it just on a whim and then how he's teaching in the ring. How did you all learn the, I guess, the old school ways? Like, how did that come about? I mean, I'll say that was the most beneficial to me working with George South and Italian Stallion. Uh, the, the, I was the very first one that went and did a, a, a match with a, a Italian Stallion's promotion, and it was in 1993, and it was me alone, and Jason Arm with me. And there was a guy who got in the ring where, once again, he just said, like, we didn't do this. We kind of, like, had an idea of the kind of the spots we were going to do in the match. We had a pretty good structure where these guys a lot of times would say, I'll just call it out there, you know, like old school way. And I was like, okay, sure, I'll, I'll listen up. And this was, like, their JBL, their enforcer, the guy who roughed people up or beat people up. And I remember I got in there and locked up, and he shoved me down, whatever. And we locked up again. He said, he said, grab a headlock. And then I, and I can't even do it that way now. Like, I grabbed it, with, like, with the right side. And he said, you grabbed a headlock with the right. What are you, Mark? And then he, like, threw me back on my head. He, like, gave me a pack suplex right on the top of my skull. Uh, but also, we were young and indestructible then, so it was nice. But just being able to learn the actual fundamentals about wrestling, the ins and outs of wrestling, and, and the terminology, that was extremely beneficial. Like, we didn't make any money with Stallion. We were paid in knowledge. So that was one thing that was very good about it. Caprice, did you feel like you got actual training from coming up through working with these guys? They were so young, obviously, showing you the ropes. But did you feel like that put you on the right path to getting to where you needed to be? Yeah, I think um, the stories that, that Matt uh, is telling, when they started getting more serious about wrestling, I was their project. Like they, I mean, not, not in a bad way, but like they, they made sure that I knew how to wrestle. They, they were showing me the wrestling hold. That is, that's very true, yeah. too. You were like our first real serious project. Yeah, because they, they had been, I think they started this in like, I don't know, 93, 94, and I didn't get there until like 95, 96. And so when I came there, their mind was like they were a training school. So like, I don't know if I got the rough end of everything, but like I, I went through the whole thing. And so uh, when I went other places, I, I knew what the holds were. I knew what the moves were. My thing was every time I went somewhere, they was like, okay, let's take this out. You're calling too much stuff. You want to do too much. You know, you want you're doing too much or whatever, because I was excited. But um, they they definitely made sure I got the training that they got other places they trained me with. And then I continue to train. Like George South and I are like, that's like, it's like one of my dads. Um, it's just you, you never stop learning. But I, I do know for a fact that the training I got from Matt and Jeff, Matt would be showing me stuff and Jeff would be flying over my head while he's teaching me stuff. But, but what they learned, they made sure that, that I knew. The crazy part is we didn't know how to wrestle when we first started going different places. We didn't know moves. We didn't know how to do moves. We didn't know what people were talking about. And they taught us as we went. So we had to learn the hard way. And people always say, who, who taught you how to wrestle? Everybody, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's, we learned the hard way how to wrestle. And then Matt and Jeff and all of us threw our experience on him so he wouldn't be messing up, trying not to mess up. You know, we tried to keep him in the, in the right lane, you know what I mean? But it, it, it was rough starting out not knowing anything. 
Questions? Anyone? Corner of the room. How you doing? My name is Jersey. I'm up from Virginia. You stated how you had a lot of indies trying to get on with you guys. Were there any legends when they saw how big Omega was becoming that decided to try and grasp onto it beyond Manny Fernandez? And um, <laughs> you were able to say yes or no to them? Uh, one thing that was, uh, was pretty cool after we met them at WWE, we had a uh, men on a mission. <laughs> that had uh, actually offered to come down, and, and Mo ended up doing it. Mabel wasn't able to make it, but like Mo from Men on a Mission was when he was there. So, I mean, it, like, the, the word was kind of out about it. And, and I think, too, like, especially in the Wild Wild West days of pro wrestling and independence, if someone thinks they can go and they can make a, a few bucks at a shot, they're going to try and get on, and they're going to make those few bucks. Because, you know, wrestling, especially in the Wild Wild West days, were survivalists, where they would do whatever they could to, to make a buck or two. Yeah, and actually, we had one of the first wrestling indie West wrestling websites that uh, the guy Al Getz, who re uh, was the manager of the Duke of New York, he, well, wrestling.com we had an Omega website, and I would get emails all the time from people, but really, you know, Steve Carino had been, I'd seen him in magazines up in, up in the Northeast and stuff, and he moved to, uh, wasn't it? Rayford, yeah, he had moved down to Rayford with his uh, parents and stuff, and so that's how we got them. That's and then he knew Joy Matthews moved down there. That's how or Joy Mercury that y'all know him by, and that's how we got them in Christian York, and they would come down from uh, Virginia. So those were the you know those kind of those guys came into uh, through through that. But I mean, I really the most of the legends and the older guys just kind of looked at us like we were crazy. Especially y'all, they look really look like the crazy. Anybody else questions? My gut says you weren't alive for any of the Omega shows, <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm sure you got a good question. What's your name, buddy? Tucker. Tucker. What's your question, Tucker? Um, um, what was Matt Hardy's favorite match? What was your favorite Omega match, Matt Hardy? Mm, I think my favorite Omega match overall was the final match we had where the serial thrillers beat the Hardy Boys for the Omega Tag Team titles. It was one of our hottest crowds. They were just they were going nuts. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great show in general, but it was uh, a nice closure as well, kind of like to wrap up our story in Omega. So I would say that's my favorite Omega match. Obviously, I had a lot of great matches that I loved with – my brother with Will the Wisp with Champagne, so so many fun matches. I I think the I mean nobody asked my opinion, but I think the best match Matt was ever in was we had Title versus Mask, Surge versus Will the Wisp, and they told a story. It, find that on tape. Matt will probably sell it to you. Um, <laughs> one of the for for Weefy. What, at, from the beginning to the end, one of the most amazing matches ever. I said, Jeff, what, what, do you want me to do anything special? He said, no, you, for your entrance. He said, no, you, you just watch. I got something special planned for you. And he had, I announced, I said, ladies and gentlemen, the demon from down under, Willow the Wisp. Willow comes out. Another Willow comes out. And like five Willow the Wisp jump surge and attack him before the real one comes out. And they wrestled a match that'll make you remember. And then... Uh, at the end, like I said, it was title versus mask, and Willow wins. Not to give anything away to you, but <laughs> Willow won the title, and then went into uh, uh, basically, you know, what we would call now, went into a shoot interview about uh, being in his brother's older brother's shadow, and he unmasked himself, even though he won the match. And it is pure emotion at the end of that match. Watch it if you can find it. That, that is, that's one of the most emotional promos Jeff had ever done because that was very real to him. He, he took so much pride in both of those personas, and they, were, and they both kind of merged into one at that time. And, folks, the, after that happened, there was not a sound in that armory because most of the people had no idea that Willow was Jeff Hardy, even though he had a Willow license plate on his car. Yeah, his car, it was Willow, because what was yours high voltage? Uh, voltage? Yeah, I did for yeah. a while until we started with WWE, and I was like, Jesus Christ, i got to get that off. I get spotted too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what happened. And 
So I, we mentioned there's about ten, people keep asking about the Omega thing, and I told Matt a few months ago, I said, hey, let's see what we can do with these, because I've got, he's got tapes, I've got tapes, my buddy Tim Noel in uh, Richmond has tapes and stuff, so uh, our, our good friends here from Title Match Wrestling, I just so happened to a number of, uh, about 10 years ago, I gave Telly Business my collection and it has been revamped and and digitized and all this good stuff so i think for the 26 omega year we're probably going to see omega on stream because matt and i've been really good about keeping the stuff on lockdown over the over the years i mean you, you can go a lot even the uh, uncommon passion that we did with high spots are like well that thing's never been i we it's, you can't see it on youtube or anything i said yeah there's a reason michael that's you know, I, you know, because Matt and I are both cheap, so uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we want to keep you know to do this. So I prefer frugal. Uh, yeah, very frugal. Uh, so maybe in the you know hopefully in the next year or so. And yes, guys, y'all will be cut in on it too. Uh, yay! Everybody gets money, right? And so uh, we we hope to do. The, I hope to get that done in the next year. Or so that'd be cool. Got time for a couple more questions here? Anybody? Yeah, hi, my name's Joey. I'm from uh, Fuquay Verena, right below Raleigh. Um, one of the guys you've mentioned before went on to his own success and everything, and that's Steve Carino, one of my personal favorites. wonder if you had any good stories on Steve Carino from the Omega days. Yeah, it, it was great. I, I remember I used to get so mad at, like, Steve Carino and Devin Storm and uh, Ace Darling and Reckless Youth, they got all the press, right? And all the wrestling magazines talked about it. I was like, how are we not getting in this press? Well, we're not in New Jersey, Philadelphia, that's why. Uh, but he, he was a great guy, and he knew who we were. And when he did come down to Rayford, as Thomas was talking about earlier, he had a promotion he was running, NWA 2000. And that actually allowed us to do like a little interpromotional angle, too. I know there was a, pr a pretty good story you have, Thomas, right, about where he beat you with the bat or whatever? Oh, well, yeah. Well, the, f the first time we actually met Steve was at the uh, Southern Pines show where you – the title tournament, right, the second show we ever ran that I was with y'all and ran in, in July of uh, – in August of, of 1997. So Steve comes in, and he's got this – little baby with him and if y'all were here it's Kobe Carino right Kobe was not even a year old then so uh, and and Steve started wrestling for us and stuff but so we're doing the NWA 2000 angle so Steve it was Steve and Joy Matthews and Christian York well I think Christian York came in last but Steve and Joy Matthews well <clears throat> nice dick Eddie Brown he had a, like a little entourage with him and so Steve has on his, you know, his wrist tape, right? He always has his wrist tape. So one wrist, it says Colby. And then the other wrist, it says Thomas Simpson likes little boys. <laughs> this guy blows it up to give me as a picture. And Steve, too. I still have the picture, actually. And so it's, it's been a big rib for years. I think some people have taken it seriously. But so this angle, so it's Joy Matthews and Steve, and the Duke of New York, I guess, was the manager. And there was this little lady against, I think it was Mike and Shane, uh, the serial thrillers. So this little lady gets after Al Getz. And she is chasing Al Getz. I'm chasing her. Well, I had a sport coat on because I, I very, rarely ever got involved in anything. And so they win, uh, Mike and Shane win, and then I get involved and I get beat down in the ring. So Steve has the baseball bat. And it's a real, it's Al, it's Al Guess's real baseball bat. So I'm laying on it, they beat me up, I'm on the ground. They take the baseball bat and Steve hits, well, I'm thinking he's gonna hit the mat with it. Oh, hell no. <laughs> Boom, right across my back. Boom, right across my back. Then he finally gets the mat, right? He finally starts hitting it. And they spray paint NWA 2000 and green paint on my, and the, the sport coat actually I had fallen uh, 
over a speed bump at a friend of mine's wedding drunk uh, a few months earlier and to uh, which if y'all remember me from years ago the people that know me like uh bud over here and uh john schuyler there in the back they they know about drunk thomas right and so so this is not a surprise uh that this had, but yeah and so they spray paint me they take the the jacket off i've never seen the jacket since then it's somewhere in sanford north carolina but I mean, I, and then of course, I have so much stuff with me and the Carinos has, ha has happened since then. Uh, and that was actually Steve's last match in Omega till we did like a little reunion thing in December of 2000 where he wrestled uh, Marty for, uh, and when Steve was the ECW champion, as a matter of fact, and he defended against Marty for, for this. And that was actually the first time on an indie show in the U.S that Steve ever defended the ECW title. And, and Paul Lee, he allowed it. We had, and Shane and uh, Shannon were on the show, wrestling with over three count. We also had, uh, Joy Matt, they wrestled Joy Matthews and Christian York, so who were in ECW at the time. So we, uh, the, the respect that the, the guys had from everybody, uh, from ECW, WCW, WWF then, it was amazing. I, I, that's all I can say. We got time for one more question. I'll get it right over here. Here we go. Hey, my name is Mike Chioda. Um, <laughs> some may know me as Bud. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you guys like so much. There's so many people up there um, that. There's so many people up there, you know, that, that I have grown uh, a lot of relationships with. And, I mean, all y'all are amazing. I got relationships with each and every one of you guys. And some I just formed, you know, Jamie, awesome. But, like, Caprice, we've had some crazy good times, you know. Um, got to see your family grow. And Marty, drag strips, you know what I mean. Matt, hearty parties. And... Lord, don't get me started on Thomas, man. I, t I tell you what, he's the original heat seeker. I tell you what, it's, some people love him, some people hate him, but I tell you what, that man over there, he's always got a place in my heart. I swear, can't no one tell me nothing bad about Thomas Simpson. And there's a bunch of guys that aren't up there. Um, growing up, I mean, it's like I caught the tail end of the wrestling career, whatever. But uh, I remember, like, going to the Sanford shows, the, the uh, Moore County Fairgrounds, you know, just seeing all this stuff because it's like I believed in – WWF, WCW, and Omega. I remember begging my dad to, Dad, carry me to Omega, carry me to Omega, carry me to the fairgrounds, to where he'd get pissed. And he's like, all right, well, you go cut the grass and this, that, and the other, the mower of lawns. Go cut the grass, go wash the cars, whatever, and then I might take you. Well, he would. So, um, sorry. Um, but no, uh, the, the one thing I want to ask, other than saying that I love all you guys, all, all y'all mean a lot to me, and I appreciate you guys, but uh, speaking of a man that can talk, um, a few years back, Marty, you gave me a tape, a little hip-hop tape. You remember that tape? Oh, yeah? You still got it in you? Can we hear a little flow from old Sham Payne? First name Sham, last name Payne. Now, there was a video that Matt posted about a month ago that went pretty viral of you guys throwing down. So I think we got to see a live demonstration from Marty Garner right. here. I, I, and Matt, I, th I, think we'll, I think what we should hear is the champagne spill because it, it was iconic in Omega. I'll do the champagne spill, maybe a little bit of rap after that. Um, champagne spill. If you don't know me, my name is Champagne. That is first name Sham, last, last name, name Payne. Payne. Former male exotic dancer from Las Vegas, Nevada, who traded my G-string for the wrestling ring. And pound for pound, the baddest man to ever step foot into the squared circle. You see, I've been around the world twice. I've seen everything but the win, and I've been everywhere but the electric cheer. I've been to two state fairs, and I've drove through hell in a gasoline truck in reverse with my hair on fire, wearing thermal underwear and a fur coat with a big red sign hanging out the window that says, Champagne is the freaking man. But wait, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this guy hadn't been around the world twice. He hadn't seen everything but the wind. You're lying to me. I am lying to you. 
I haven't been around the world twice. I've been around the world three times. I've seen everybody but the devil, and I can do anything but have a baby. I've been from Moore County to Montana, from Sanford to Sally, because when I get in the ring, baby, I am the grand finale. I've been to the North Pole, and I've sailed the seven seas. I've beat opponents in the ring with the one, two, three. I could eat killer bees, but because it don't faze me, I beat the blind, the crippled, the lame, or the crazy from eight to 80, because it don't matter, baby. And just because I'm beautiful, Matt Hardy, don't hate me. I promise I won't. My goodness. Wow. You know, Tracy, uh, Marty Garner's first WWF match was against Jeff Jarrett. And last night, he got his head taken in by Jeff Jarrett. So I think it only makes sense next year maybe we get Jeff Jarrett versus first name Sham. Last yes. name Payne at WrestleCade. Yes. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Hey, and I also was talking to Jeff Jarrett last night after the thing, Jeff and Karen versus Matt and Rebby. Yeah. 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 I have had several requests for that already, actually. I don't know if Jeff Jarrett wants any of that, and I ain't talking about Matt Hardy here. I'm talking about Queen Rebecca. Uh, she, she, he's talking about her, his favorite Hardy. My That's favorite my wife, Hardy. Rebecca I want to make Hardy. that very clear. I, this, this is a shoot. When I started the podcast with Matt, I was like, all right, I got to get on Rebby's good side here. That's very important to dealing with the Matt Hardy brand. So I sent them a $250 edible arrangement right off the bat because <laughs> I know women love chocolate. So uh, some, some good advice. And I, I think that half-ass got me over a little bit in the house, Hardy. So. Half-ass. I think you've made it work, <laughs> yeah. man. Uh, wow. What, what a special day this was and a special morning here at WrestleCade. Uh, first off, uh, aside from even the panel, we were all – so grateful you guys all came out to support us here and, and on yes. behalf thank of the you, panel, thank we you thank you all for coming you. out uh, again you can check out the extreme life of matt hardy wherever you get your podcasts every single friday and at extremehardy.com uh, several of these guys have been great resources for research for the extreme life of matt hardy so i appreciate you guys on that and on behalf of the entire audience we thank you guys uh, let's give them all a big round of applause guys for this outstanding panel I'm going to let Matt have the final say here, but before I do, real quick, um, at the end of the panel, after Matt finishes, we're going to take a big group shot of the entire Omega Reunion panel, and it will be available for VIP purchase for $25. You can see Tracy over there in the corner, and you get a free poster there. Uh, but Matt, anything else you'd like to add here? Uh, I think to close it out... Uh we really appreciate you guys coming out and uh, listening to our story, which is just something that really came from all of our hearts and souls. It is really a common passion we all shared, and the brotherhood was as real as it gets between all of us. And thank you guys for coming out and, uh, and, and joining us as we reminisce back. Thank you, buddy. Look at that guy. <laughs> and uh, to close it out, I, uh, I think Broken Mad would say, uh, yeah, oh, this panel was absolutely wonderful. How awesome was that, Matt? It doesn't get any better than that. Oh, man, what a what a great fun ride down a sentimental boulevard. It was so great yeah. to spend, spend time with those guys and, and just sit back and have a nice casual conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. And it was a great turnout. The crowd was uh, really responsive. They seemed to enjoy it as well. So it, it, was, it was a really, really fun time. Champagne doing the freestyle. Oh my God. What about the standing O yet at the end? Unbelievable. So cool. And I was so grateful to be a part of that. So thank you for letting me be a part of that and nice. get a chance to get the Omega experience in person. Indeed. It was truly a special day that I will never forget for the rest of my career. And again, guys, I can't believe this, Matt. We are on episode 52 next week, a full year's worth yeah. of Extreme Life and Matt Hardy. And we'll kick off 2023 with a, a look back at the first year of the podcast. But uh, we're going to be doing the Hardy Awards. We're going to hear Matt Hardy's mm. top picks of 2023, 2022. Sorry. Uh, it's very late as we tape this right now. 
but but we're going to be hearing your top picks of 2022 the best wrestlers the okay. best events the best matches maybe even some of the worst who's to say i'd be curious to hear some of your thoughts across the board there and uh you're, you're pretty you're you're pretty on top of the wrestling landscape so i try i try we'll see how oozy you're feeling as we do our award uh, here on next week's edition of the podcast. But man, I just, I just want to say for those of you celebrating the holidays, whether it's Hanukkah, Christmas or whatever, it may be a, a happy holidays from Matt and I. Yes. Uh, so, so, so grateful for those of you who do spread the holiday cheer and the good vibes. Aren't we Matt? Absolutely. Yes. Happy holidays. So many people out there have tuned into this podcast this year. It was so amazing when I seen uh, viewing some of the Spotify, the, the 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 top fives of the year. We were in so many of those, and in there with such great competition, like you know, I am Jericho, which is one of the top podcasts around, and my good close personal friend as it is. Anyway, I love Chris, um, but thank you guys. It it means a lot, and 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 from the bottom of my heart, I hope everyone out there has a very nice Christmas. I hope you get to spend time with your family and your friends and your loved ones, and. Uh, I uh, I am so blessed and so lucky in my life. I've wished for so long, and I wish for all of you today. I, I wish all the best for all of you, and I hope twenty twenty three ends up being everyone's greatest year ever. Leave that five cinco five cinco five star review. We'll be drawing a winner for a free T shirt next week. The words have been spoken. We'll see you next week right here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hart. <sighs> I feel strongly that saving money is important. You know, if it's not something we worry about now, boy, we are really going to worry about it later. And I want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments. I'm talking to you if you're in a 30 year loan. Now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut five, 10, even 15 years off their loan. And you can do this without perfect credit with no money out of pocket. You've just got to start at savewithconrad.com.